So good morning. Welcome to uh, PGCon, for those of you who just got here. If not, uh, welcome back. So my name is Jonathan Katz, and today we're going to be doing an, expo an exploration in application building. Um, and just maybe, well, I'll give the high-level picture of the talk in a, in, a, in a couple of slides. But I'd say, you know, the, the genesis of this was I actually did this as a much shorter talk. And the first time I gave this much shorter talk, I was like, wow, there's a lot of material in here. And even, even trying to do it in 40 minutes, it ended up going over into an hour. I was like, well, maybe, maybe I could expand this into a tutorial and just go into like, all these really interesting concepts about Postgres. Then, of course, I tried writing the tutorial, which you were about to see today. And I was like, wow, it's actually a little bit harder to expand everything. You know, it's somewhere in between like a, it might be in between like a three-hour talk and, a, you know, and an hour and a half talk. But, that said, you know, my, you know, my background is in uh, application development and particularly, you know, using Postgres. Like, I find every single excuse to take advantage of all the many features. And, you know, the, the idea is that a lot of these concepts in the talk are going to be, you know, things I've been in Postgres for, you know, 20 years, maybe, if not 30 years. And it's really about, like, taking all these pieces together to see what we've been able to do with Postgres for so long and taking a brand new feature added in 9.4 that, you know, has been expanded upon a lot, you know, since then. And, you know, saying, all right, well, here's a completely different way to do it. What's funny is the punchline for all that is maybe, you know, 10 to 15 minutes long at the very end. This talk is going to build up on a lot of, you know, some fundamental database concepts to some advanced database concepts, you know, to get there. And it's going to be funny because we're going to spend a lot of time on one particular aspect and then say, oh, by the way, here's a completely different way to do it. And that's, you know, and, you know, that's really the, the theme of it. So I want to give you the chance to escape in the beginning um, in, case, in case this is not what you're interested in. But... That's, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and that's pretty much the summary. So, uh, you know, perhaps to kick it off a little bit, just a little bit about myself. A little bit. Oh, so the other thing I should also say, the reason I'm not doing, like, the full presenter mode is that there's going to be a lot of, you know, going back and forth. We're going to run a lot of example code. I mean, in some cases, we're just going to go over every single line of code to see what it means, you know, particularly when you get to some of the advanced queries. So I will be doing a lot of alt-tabbing like this. Um, I'm also going to make it so you can try to follow along and like put into you know, your code base if you want to play along as we go along. Uh, let's see how that goes, but uh, I'm going to do my best to do so. So without further ado, okay, so far so good. There we go. There we go. All right. So first. Really briefly about my company, which I do want, I want, because it's PGCon, I don't want to get very corporate about it, but Crunchy Data enables me to talk about really fun Postgres stuff. I love it there. Um, and we're hiring, like every other company. Next, uh, about me. So actually, the, the way I got active in the Postgres community was around event organizing, because I saw a lot of brilliant developers, particularly at PGCon. I was like, wow, I cannot write C that well. But it seems like you know, there's an opportunity to organize events, bring people together, and do fun things like that. And you know, I found, you know, I find myself doing that. Um, I've also been using Postgres a long time. You know, I usually say I've been using it about 15 years, maybe well for seven. And you know, for me, it's always something that I always gravitated towards. Even you know, a lot of my earlier web projects, like I just wanted to use Postgres. I get you know, building web stuff, like, and I enjoyed it, but. You know, for me, it was about using, it was really all about the data in the database. So, like, for me, it's just so excited to see how the Postgres community has, well, one, it's grown itself, but also, you know, five years ago, I, you know, I talk about Postgres with people, and the first question after that would be, what's Postgres? And, you know, we don't have that problem anymore, and to me, it's, it's still mind-blowing. Um, and, you know, I think it's cool, and now we're at the point where, you know, in my, in my humble opinion, it's now educating more how to use Postgres to its fullest potential that people now realize, oh, this is a really cool piece of technology, but they still don't, you know, I, look, I'm, like I said, I've been using it for 15 years. I still find out about features every single, you know, every single day. Well, maybe not every single day, but quite often. Like, I'm like, oh, I didn't know it could do this. And, you know, it, it, it really takes a community to teach it everything that Postgres can do and also just, like, throwing it in practice and seeing, you know, you know, different, you know different things of doing it. Uh, the, the one shameless plug I will give here is please follow at PostgreSQL on Twitter. Uh, it launched in January. It is a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, please follow. No, it's got to do it this way. All right, so, uh, so I kind of gave the overview of this already because I got too excited and, you know, the coffee is starting to kick in. But really we're going to be exploring building an application together. I mean, that, that's the theme of it today. First, we'll do a little bit about, you know, setting up the requirements in case you want to try to follow along. Again, your mileage may vary. I think it will probably vary a lot. 
um, a little bit of overview of the problem that we're going to try to solve because you know this is a real world problem. I actually um, I actually ripped this from something that I did set up and you know from you know and basically how I evolved a system. This is more the simplified version of it, which maybe you'll see some of the SQL and you'll be like, this is the, the simple version. But um, yeah, no, this is this is something that's very real. And you know, like good developers, we're going to code it, we're going to build, we're going to test, we're going to iterate until we get it to the way that we want to. And of course, like during, you know, I, do, I don't want this to just be me like yammering for three hours. You know, if questions do come up, you know, I'm ha more happy to field them. If you want to say like you're doing this stupidly, like I'm also more than willing to hear that too. Um, if if I say like you know, please wait to the end, it's probably because I do think we're hitting like the, the talk becoming a four and a half hour talk, and I want to make sure we have enough time for lunch. All right. What are our requirements for this talk? First, we're going to be using Postgres 10. Why? Because it's the latest version, and I actually do use some things that are specific to Postgres 10, and I will point those out. Um, Walti JSON. Walti JSON is an extension for the punchline at the end using the logical decoder. Basically, it allows you to stream all the changes that are coming from your database in a highly digestible JSON format. Thank you so much. Oh. Um, and Python 3. And why Python 3? Because Python 2 is being deprecated in a year and a half. It is coming. It is real now. This is not 2014 where they originally planned to deprecate it. And actually, since Python 3.5, when they introduced the, uh, the, the new async I.O. framework, like, it's really fast. Like, they did a really good job with it. And that's a whole separate discussion. Specifically, we'll be using the Psycho PG2 library, which is one of the drivers for, um, for you know, interfacing with Postgres and Python. Uh, the reason specifically we're using this one, uh, other than it being around for a very long time, is that it supports the logical decoding. And basically reading in changes from the logical decoding stream, which is very important for this talk. So, again, for those following along, trying to build it as we go, um, I, will, I will assume that you know how to install Postgres. Actually, real quick, before I go on, who's new to Postgres? This is like, your, who's your like, first Postgres conference? Cool, welcome. And if you're new to Postgres, have you used other databases before? Cool. So like, are you coming from like an Oracle background, MongoDB background, SQL Server? Yeah, cool. So yeah, so you'll see actually, you know, some, there's some like certain feature parallels between all of them, except maybe MongoDB. Um, and yeah, th th that's actually good to note in order to frame the talk. So one thing that's great about Postgres is that it's very extensible. And there's a lot of extensions that are built into it, particularly in the, con you know, we call them contrib modules. Um, but there are also some that exist outside of it. You can install some of those using PGXN, which is the Postgres extension network. And there's a Python wrapper that lets you do that. <laughs> and there, then there are some that live off on their own that are incredibly useful, and you have to do a little bit more work to get them in. And Wall2JSON is one of those. So essentially, you know, you do a git clone, go into the directory, uh, you have to set this flag, use pgxs equals 1, and hit make. And then you have to sudo make install using that same flag. Um, so currently, it does not work with uh, Postgres 11 beta 1 right out of the box. You do need to, I did hack that to get that to work. Um, and I should probably submit that upstream. Uh, again, ugly C, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, but with 10 and below, this definitely works very well. On the other things, after you install it, you do need to restart Postgres. Yes, Mr. Fetter. What broke? What? What broke? Uh, it was a function. So basically, the, a function definition changed for oh, I can't ex remember exactly what, but it was a it was an API function definition that changed, and you just need to put in compiler flags, and it works. It changes the new interface. I'll uh, I can I can show you the code during the break. Oh yeah, and key thing: restart Postgres after you do this, so it loads it. All right, uh, setting up Python 3 and Psycho PG2. I can, uh, so if you don't have Python 3 on your machine, you can download it from python.org. They have an installer pretty much for every platform. Or you can apt get Python, yum install Python 3, you know, whatever floats your boat. I like to use virtual environments with Python. Um, they basically allow you to install your requirements locally to a particular environment. I actually do, I love Py Py Python. It's probably my favorite programming language. I do think some other languages do the, the packaging a little bit better than Python, but you know, Python's getting there, it's improved a lot. Um, you activate that virtual environment, and then you can install Psycho PG2. This installs by default, like, I think it's like 278 now, maybe 275, but basically the, the 27 line. All right, enough, enough uh, boilerplate. Let's start building an application. 
So what's the problem we're trying to solve? So imagine we're managing this room. We're in DMS 1150, and you know, a lot of events happen here. You know, classes happen, PGCon happens, whatever it may be. You know, we need to manage, we need to manage this space. Um, we know that there's a set of operating hours in which we can book this space. You know, let's say it's probably you know, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. You know, college runs a little bit later. I don't think the University of Ottawa wants people using this in the middle of the night, but I don't know. But yeah, no, typically you, know, you have an opening and a closing hour. And to keep it simple, only one booking can occur in the room at a given time. That, you know, and that makes sense for a lot of things. You know, if, you, you know, if you're booking a meeting in here, you, we probably don't want to have two meetings going on at the same time. Now, in the real world, if you're at, let's say, a restaurant, you can have multiple events going on at the same time. And, you know, that's, and that's where it starts getting complicated. But for us, let's just keep it simple. Like, if the room is booked, it's booked. If it's not booked, well, it might be open. For, for business, it might be closed. Do we understand that? Good with that? This is the, you know, if we, if we don't understand this, the rest of the talk will not make sense. So here's the example. Right now, we've booked, you know, DMS 1150 for three hours. And there's some rooms next to it that might have, uh, you know, that might have some other events going on. I mean, this is, you know, this is your typical booking schedule. So if you're planning to go to the unconference and you want to bail on the talk early, you now know exactly when to leave. So, so what does this actually mean on the database level? Because, you know, this is, you know, I always like to think of, like, analogy between math and computer science. You know, you, you do math. You can write everything out. You see how it all works. You can see the proof. And then you have to code it. And, you know, there's certain assumptions or, I guess, maybe not assumptions, but there's certain things that you can kind of hand wave when you're doing the math that you can't when you're actually programming it. So the same thing, like, you know, what do we need to know to actually set up, you know, what data do we need to have in our database to make this application work? Well, first off, we need to know all the rooms that are available to book, which makes sense because we need to know the rooms that we need to book. Um, we need to know when they're available to be booked, so they're operating hours, so we need to store what their given operating hours are for a given day, which, you know, can change. You know, maybe, you know, this is not open on Sunday, so there's, you know, zero operating hours. We also need to know when the rooms have been booked, so that way we don't uh, book things overlapping them. That's also important. You know, double booking is annoying. So the other thing is, of course, you know, we're trying to build up an application. So we need to do our standard CRUD operations. We need to create, read, update, delete. You know, that, you know, that makes sense. And, you know, I, you know, let's think about it in two different aspects. You know, there's the create, update, delete part, essentially the management part. And then there's the reading part. And the goal is that we want both of those systems to be efficient. We, of course, want to be able to do lookups quickly. We also want to be able to manage it quickly. So believe it or not, this is, yeah, th there's a lot going on here. Because if you think about the system, like, you know, it, sound, it sounds fairly simple, but there's actually a lot going on behind the scenes, or we're going to have to put a lot going on behind the scenes to make this work. So first, you know, I'd like to, you know, this is where to introduce, you know, availability and how to manage, you know, how to measure availability, find availability, and look at it. And we're basically going to start with some of the building blocks of Postgres. The first and probably most important and probably the feature that's been most useful in my career in Postgres are dates and times. Who's worked with dates and times in Postgres? Yeah. They're really, really powerful. So... These are the fundamental dates and times types within Postgres. Um, you know, we have timestamps with or without time zones. There, you can definitely get into a very long debate about whether or not you should store your time zone within, within your data type. I choose the yes side. The one thing I strongly advocate is keep your database in UTC because that transfers very well and you will avoid weird time zone issues. That's, again, I... I think I have a talk where we spend just like 30 minutes talking about time zones, so we're hand-waving this. Uh, dates. Dates are one of my favorite types. Like, you'll see that, you know, dates appear throughout here, but basically you can just store the date, no timestamp, no time. You know, they're very easy to work with. And then there's times. There's time with time zone and time without time zone. So the time is just like, you know, 9 a.m., 12 p.m., no concept of date. I typically use time without time zone, which you just specify it by doing time, um, and I've had, you know, very few issues with that. And intervals. Intervals are one of my favorite. An interval is something like you could say three days, five hours, ten seconds. And essentially it's your delta. And one you could, I mean, usually I use the delta when, um, you know, when, when, when I'm doing calculations and operations, but you can store the delta, which is particularly useful if you're generating rules or need, a, need an incremental offset as you go along. So 
how do these work? Yeah, and in fact, you know, part of, basically, the, so this exercise, we're going to just look at some of, basically just look what, what's a little bit underneath the covers a little bit, and what happens when you do math, because there is some magic in these statements. So the first one is, let's see what our current date is. And, you know, what returns when we do that. Sure enough, lo and behold, it's correct. My system clock is correct. And what's the type of it? It is a date. Nothing too magical. What about current time? Uh, so current time returns the time using uh, the time with time zone format. That's good to know. And actually, if you ever, you know, if you want the current time stamp, you just do select current time stamp and voila. Of course, the type of current time. I probably should have done that to say what the, what the data type was. Now, what happens if we do current date plus current time? Lo and behold, we get a timestamp. And we've actually kind of magically uh, you know, transformed into that type. The point of this is that the, you know, we're going to look a little bit about the operators and functions around date and time, but they're very robust. And it's definitely worthwhile reading the documentation around them because it gets very deep very quickly. Um, and here's, like another, here's another one of my favorites. If I do select current date plus 3, voila, you know, it's three days from now. I don't, need to do, I don't need to use an interval for that, which is also really important because uh, you know, when you do the interval, there, you do have to do the cast. And while they're very useful, there is a little bit of a performance penalty because you saw that's a 12-byte object. And you know, by the way, just to show, it's still a date type. Cool stuff. So some other useful functions, particularly that will be in this exercise, uh, there's date trunk. Date trunk is short for date truncation. And basically, you can specify a period and take your, your time stamp or your date or whatever it is and truncate it to that period. So let's go through a few of these. Maybe we won't do it one at, one at a time. So the first one we say, hey, take the current date and truncate it to the beginning of the week. So lo and behold, it truncates it to uh, 528, which is today's Wednesday, right? So that's Monday. So it truncates it to the, the ISO start of the week, because you see some calendars, they start on Sunday. And we see some calendars, they start on Monday. By the fall, this is going to Monday. What if we truncate the, the first day of the month? Lo and behold, it does get us to May 1st. How about the quarter? I mean, how many times do you get asked, to, hey, run this quarterly report to see you know, what our cash flow was? Well, sure enough, you can do that very easily in Postgres, where you can at least truncate the date. And then, last but not least, the year. Yep, we can get back to the beginning of the year. One of the reasons I show this one off is that this is very useful in reporting. I've used this many, many, many times to generate all those fun business reports. And what's nice is that, um, you know, particularly in ag you know, aggregate queries, this is where I find the, the date chunk very useful. Uh, I actually had a, had a it's called like a, a reporting sub-application where you could specify, you know, you know, how, you know, how do you want to view this port? You know, you know, year, month, week, day, you know, whatever it may be. And, you know, in a SQL injection save way, it basically would map to the appropriate uh, time period. Uh, you, know, you know, pull everything together, do the J truncation, do the aggregate, and spit out all the information. It's just like so cool because it was so simple to do. So another thing, another thing which is part of the SQL standard is the extract function, which is basically you can extract a date part from uh, a date or a timestamp. Yeah. So I mean, you know, it does exactly what I think it does. Um, you, can, you know, you can extract the year, you can extract the month, extract the day, and there's also this thing ISO DOW, which is the ISO day of the week. So Postgres has two ways to extract the day of the week, where the day of the week is an integer corresponding to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The ISO standard way of doing it is assigning one to Monday, up until seven, which is Sunday. The Postgres, I don't want to say it's the default one because it's not, but uh, the regular DOW function in Postgres, it does, I believe, zero for, I don't want to mess this up. Cause, and that's the other thing. Every other, the, this is why you got to use the ISO one because every language tries to do it their own way. I want to say, basically in Postgres, one starts at zero and starts at six. I can't remember if it's Monday or Sunday, and that's kind of the point. You see ISO standard one, where Monday is one, Sunday is seven, and you just increment through there. All right. 
So this is getting us towards trying to figure, you know, build our, you know, our uh, scale chilling application. So one of the operators you have in Postgres is something called between and and, where basically you can look to see if something is in a particular range. You often see this with integer lookups. You can do this with uh, timestamps or, or dates. So in the first one, we say, hey, you know, what week is what week is uh, this our current date in? Um, is it you know? This is actually between Monday and Sunday of the week, where I got lazy. I didn't put in 5.28 and uh, 6.3. I basically said, you know, use this date truncation function. And using an interval 2 to show it off. And survey says, yes, this is actually in the week that we believe it is. If we want to expand on that function a little bit, or just to see what's going on, let's, uh, let's see how we truncated the date. Oh, no. Clearly, I'm a Vim pro. Oh, there we go. Yeah, sure enough, uh, it goes from Monday to, that's actually, uh, that's the next Monday, right? Yeah. All right, but that's fine. And for the purposes of this exercise, we can see that, uh, you know, this, you know, 1230 falls within that week. The other important function that we have is overlaps. So basically, overlap says, can you see if two ranges of dates uh, overlap with each other, or two ranges of timestamps overlap with each other? So in this case, you know, I took, you know, originally I actually thought this was from 9 to 12.30, so I built the examples around that, only to find out, oh no, we actually have 30 less minutes together. Um, so basically, I want to see, does the time we have this tutorial overlap with um, 11 a.m. and 1 p.m.? All right, this is also part of the SQL standard. And yes, that makes sense. You know, it, they do overlap. This is the proof that it works. But here's an interesting thing with overlaps. You know, an important thing, particularly in scheduling, is to see if things, you know, line up next to each other. So does my end time of 12.30, you know, from 9 a.m. to 12.30 overlap with starting from 12.30 and going to uh, 1 p.m.? Because that's important, because we need to see, if, you know, because if we say, like, the two 12.30 endpoints overlap, then we can't actually book that second event. But think about it as humans. Well, we can, because they're both right next to each other. So does it work? Let's, let's take a poll. Do you think this will return true or false? True basically says they both overlap. False says they don't. We have false. False is the consensus. It is false. Good, it's sane. It works the way we think it does. But that's actually, that's, but that's actually a very really important point because, um, you know, that could lead to, you know, if it didn't work the way we thought it did, it could lead to double bookings, which is bad. So, good, this is sane. Now, of course, the, you know, right now this is still academic. We're, we're basically doing one-off lookups. Like, we need to actually see how this works over an entire data set because that's going to determine how we structure our application. So, now the fun part. Let's start benchmarking or doing hand-waving benchmarking, because benchmarking is a very deep topic that... Oh, if, if you ever want to do something fun, look up Greg Smith and benchmarking, those two terms, and just, like, see his talks and or buy his book about uh, Postgres performance. Like, that is essentially the tome on, like, not only, like, Postgres performance, but uh, database performance. And I, Greg is not paying me to say that. All right, so we're going to create a table. It's going to be called bookings. Now, here's a Postgres 10 specific feature that's very important. That's part of the SQL standard. Identity columns. What is an ID? So, who's uh, had to create primary key? Well, I, who, let me put it this way. Who's created circuit keys using Postgres with the serial data type? Yeah. Who likes using the serial data type? Because it's obviously SQL compliant. I mean, I do like using it. But here's the awesome thing about Postgres 10. We've actually introduced something that's part of the SQL standard for generating increment, uh, you know, key increments, you know, similar to like MySQL auto increment, and this is called uh, identity keys. I don't think that I don't think there could be a full talk on them themselves. I think there could be a lightning talk on it, hint into anyone who wants to talk about it. But basically, what it's saying there, that line says ID integer, uh, generated by default as identity. That's essentially saying the same thing as serial. Like, hey, create like a sequence that's incrementing in this case by the default, which is one. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, this is essentially enabling this, you know, ident you know an identity-like function. Uh, it supports, uh, I believe, small int, int, and big int. Um, I, don't, I don't think anyone uses small int anymore. 
if you do, please talk to me because I'm curious what you're using it for. Um, either use integer or big integer. And please only use big integer if you truly need big integer because there is a performance hint because it's eight bytes instead of four bytes. And this, you know, if this is your primary key, you're probably looking up that key quite often and you need speed. It is. I believe so, yeah. I think, I think it's uh, in 2011, but I could be wrong. I can now just be spouting things, but yeah. This is, I think that's the reason why we did it, because otherwise serial, you know, in, in true Postgres you know, mentality, serial worked. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm sorry? Yeah, you, I mean, you could, use, you could use sequences as well. I mean, that's, I mean, ultimately, that's what it's interfacing with. You know, it's just a little, now it's a little bit more behind the scenes. Yeah, exactly. Like, and I think, you know, that's actually one, if you've seen one pattern in, like, the, the current Postgres release, it's, it's about making life easier. And this could lead to a gigantic uh, tangent on partitioning, which we will save for later. Um, cool. So let's actually create, oh, so before we get to way too off topic, so here's our bookings table. And again, very basic. We have, a, we have our uh, primary key. We have a start time and an end time, which is in the timestamp format. And essentially what we're going to do is that we're going to insert a bunch of uh, bookings uh, into this table. Now, um, I'm trying to think. We're going to parse this function a little bit later, but generate series. Often you see this function called generate series, which is a set returning function that can return a series of information or a series of data. In this case, I'm using it for integers. You can actually also use it to return dates and times and you know, basically generate a whole slew of data. Often you see this as a function used for generating random test garbage data for the purposes of presenting. But it does more than that, and you can actually use it in real applications, which we're going to see later. But I did want to introduce this concept now. So basically what I'm doing is I said, hey, you know, from 1 to 400,000 times, insert you know, this you know, starting from you know, April 1st, 2003, insert, an, you know, insert um, this range where we increment by one days, two days, three days, four days. So basically 400,000 days into the future. Uh, as you can see, I spent a lot of time figuring out how to, uh, you know, what, what the test data set should be. So actually, let's turn on the timing mode. Okay. So they all insert. They all inserted fairly quickly, you know, about 1.6 seconds on my machine. But the point of this is that we're not benchmarking it just yet. Now, now of course, if we tried to start looking up over 1.2 million rows, Postgres is fairly fast. But if we're doing like a specific operational lookup and we're doing a sequential scan, we basically we're scanning all 1.2 million rows to get our information. That could take a little time. In fact, let's do that real quick. Let's say, you know, let's see if we have any bookings during the time of our tutorial. So I'm going to use explain analyze, which explain generates a query plan, and analyze actually executes that query plan and gives you uh, your actual results for executing each step of the plan. Oh, awesome. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, shit, no. It's going horribly wrong. There we go. All right. So as you can see, uh, we do a sequential scan. You know, we can, you know the, plan, the plan is able to, to work very quickly, but the execution time is 83 milliseconds, which actually I could say is not that bad. It's fairly quick. Now, if this is an OLTP application, and there's, let's say, a thou even 1,000 of us hitting all of this at the same time, your performance is going to get very shitty very quickly. Pardon my language. I'm a New Yorker. Um, so we need, to, you know, we, we need to do a little bit better. And if you look at most databases, um, you know, the, the index that you're offered is the B tree, which is short for B tree, but essentially it's a balanced indexing tree. Um, and it's not like, you know, it's not, well, oh yeah, well, hang on, I forgot, we're, we're using a basic type. So yeah, we're using, a, so we're, we will be using a B tree index for this. Um, so the, the reason I chose a multi-column index it will become clear in a second. So actually, first off, who's, are you familiar with multi-column indexes? Cool. All right. So, so it's in a single column index, it does basically you're doing an index lookup on one value. In a multi-column index, you're able to use the index lookup for two values. And this is particularly important if, 
If you find that you're frequently looking up the same two values in an index, you might want a multi-column index, particularly if you have a lot of columns in the table, or if you have a lot of, you have additional information associated with that single column. So this is actually a good example. If I'm looking over a table where there's, a, you know, there's dates and a lot of these, a lot of starting times, and there's the same starting time is associated with similar end times, the multi-column index graph should be very useful. Ordering does matter in, in Postgres multi-column indexes, because if you're doing a lookup only on the first column, uh, particularly start time, then um, it's, you know, it, basically, it basically looks at the first column first and the second column second. That, you know, that's how it orders it. So if you're doing a lot of individual lookups on the end time, you might actually need two separate indexes here, and that would get better. The advantage of uh, the multi-column index is that they will be, it is a little bit smaller in size compared to having two separate single column indexes. Um, but of course, buyer beware, you need to make sure that it makes sense for, for your data type. In this case, the reason I chose the multi-column index is that I know, well, one, I want to show it off, but two, I know that I'm more likely to start looking at my start time versus my end time here. It might not actually be like all, all that useful um, in this case, but we can create it. And actually, what would have been more useful is comparing it to the other size. But as you can see, it's actually, it's actually not that large. Actually, let's, sorry, if you, if you don't mind, let, let's play around real quick. Of course, that's legible. So we'll create an index for start time. Let's do one for end time. Here we go. Cool. And then if we look up the size. show you that I'm not crazy. So as you see, the size of the two separate indexes is uh, 17 megabytes each for a grand total of 20, uh, 34 megabytes, but our multi-column index is 24 megabytes. So if you can use them and it makes sense for your data set, try to use a multi-column index. But again, you really need to understand your lookups and uh, your data sets. So let's actually drop those indexes because I don't want to mess up our query plans. So, what happens? So now let's go back. So, yes, yeah, sorry. Sorry, which index scan? So there's this feature coming out in 11 called covering indexes where that could be the case. But... 11 is in beta right now. That might be actually worthwhile testing maybe at a break, but yeah. Right now, no, it would not, it would not use it. You'd have to have the separate index for it. All right, so let's take those, uh, the, so remember those two queries we did on the other slide um, where we first were looking to see, um, well, one was the overlaps, like we wanna see are there any bookings in the room right now when we're doing the tutorial? And the second one is, well, let's see, um, let's see if, Okay, let's do the first one first. So let's see if there's any bookings in our room right now. And let's see if it uses the index. So we run it, and it says, no, I'm not going to use the index. I'm going to do a sequential scan on this, which really sucks because that's a very important query for us to run. So the lesson is, even though we have the ability to do the overlap, you know, the SQL standard overlapping uh, lookups in Postgres, it's, uh, it's basically not programmed to use the index. Yes. Because it doesn't see that that index is there, so I'm wondering if that's what you need. Let's try that. Good point. Actually, I, I, full disclosure, I did do this earlier. It is not. Yes, I did. I meant to run analyze target. I'm sorry. But what about? Um, well, also because like, there are. Yeah, that's yeah. There's there's a lot of rows there, so. 
it should it really should be picking up the index. That's why I want to make sure we had a fairly large data set. Um, all right, so what about this one, um, which basically says, and basically, so this, so the next query is like, can we find any bookings that are essentially today, like between you know, uh, you know, five thirty and five thirty one? Does this use the index? It does, and it returns much more quickly than the other one. You know, it's you know sub, uh, you know, sub millisecond time. And the reason is, is that it's using some standard B tree operations that it can recognize, excuse me, which are uh, greater than or equal to and uh, less than or equal to, which is a very well understood function for B trees. So that's, you know, and you know, why, why would this function be important though? Um, if we go back to the beginning, this is saying, um, in this case, return an unordered list of all the events occurring on 530, you know, within our, our given space. Which is something that you know we will be seeing as we get later into the calendaring app. So, long story short, um, as you can see, as you can see in the notes at the bottom, you know the overlap did not hint the index. But you know, you know, if we're able to see, if we're able to basically say, hey, let me look up everything within a particular range, I can, you know, I can basically do, well, I could probably get to the equivalent of that overlap function. But that's not convenient because then we need to understand some range math, and like we don't want to understand math, we just want to be able to program. So, the good news is that we actually have something called a range data type. So, how many people are familiar with range types in Postgres? Cool. So, range types um, basically allow you to store ranges and work with ranges and perform operations on ranges. And ranges, you know, can be all sorts of things. Like, you know, we're going to be working with like dates and times and timestamps, but there's also uh, you know, integer ranges, numeric ranges that are built in. And Postgres itself being very extensible, you can write your own range types. It's actually fairly easy to extend like a, an inet range type or an internet range type within Postgres. Like you don't you don't need any additional hooks or functions into it, um, but you know you can, you can come up with your own. I'm not I'm not very imaginative, so I'm not sure what else ones you want. I've been able to use all the standard built-in ones, but it's um, you know they're they're a lot of fun and they actually changed my life significantly. Actually, the author of the range types is at this conference, Jeff Davis. Like, if you do find this useful, I suggest you go up to him and say thank you, because he did it as a complete labor of love for, I think it was like three or four years to, to try to get it in. Come on. Advance. So how does it work? Well, so we'll create a similar table to what we did before. We're going to call it bookings2, so we don't mix it up with the other one. We're going to have identity key, but we're also going to have something called uh, a new com called booking time, with it, which is a TSTZ range. TSTZ range stands for a timestamp with time zone range. Essentially, instead of storing start time and end time as separate columns, we can store the range all within one. Uh, there's a lot of nuances with range types. Actually, let's, let's go over some of the nuances real quick uh, with uh, TSTZ ranges. Let's do... Timestamp. So it's actually kind of challenging to like turn your head and type shit. See. All right. So we get that we get this column returned, and we see that at the beginning there's a you know, square bracket, and at the end there's a parenthesis. What does that mean? Who remembers pre-calculus dealing with ranges and range notation? Yeah. <laughs> this has come back, and it's come back in a real way. So basically, if you see something like this, what this really means is that you know, 1 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 2. If you see something like this, or, yeah, it means that you know, 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 2. And then you know any combination in between. Now the reason that's important is this is how range type the range type data is returned in Postgres. And you actually might see some odd things too, um, you know, based on some particular defaults. And there's one I'd like to show you. Let's say we want to create an integer range, uh, which you have to use in for range to do that. And I just try to do the default. You know, I say I want the range to be between one and ten. Well, oh shit, that didn't do what I thought it would do. Um, okay, never mind. 
there used to be a case where, I'm trying to figure which type it is, but basically you'd put in something, you think you'd be getting the range that you wanted, and, oh, here we go. I remember the case. So let's say I want to get all integers between uh, 1 and 10 inclusive. So 1 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 10. And I hit enter, and it returns 1 to 11. And you're looking at that, you're like, what? Why would it do that? Well, the idea is that they want the output to resemble something where you could link ranges together. So basically, if you, knew, you want to check for contiguous ranges next to each other, you could link them all together. It was actually something uh, Mr. David Fetter pointed out to me many years ago. So even though you're saying, you know, I want this inclusive range, it's going to return 1 inclusive, 11 exclusive to put it in just for that. This is, act like, the first time I saw that, I was like, I don't understand why you would do that, because I saw it on the discrete integer range. But when dealing with, like, uh, the date ranges, that became incredibly useful, which we'll see uh, implicitly as we go along here. So TLDR, ranges are very powerful. You should play around with them to understand all the nuances. And there's actually a lot of operators and functions with ranges that we will be covering as we go through this talk, but I highly suggest, you know, like most things, to read the manual on. So with that said, let's start creating our data. And basically, we have a population function similar to what we saw before. We're populating all the other things. I'm actually using this as an opportunity to also introduce lateral. Who, is, who are familiar with lateral queries? Cool. All right. Lateral was introduced in Postgres 9... Four, I believe. And basically what it says, it's a, I would say, you know, the way I would define it in my simple brain is that it essentially allows you to do like a join that operates on the from query and basically allows you to say, hey, apply a certain function to data coming out from the from so that way, you know, we can have it all together and, you know, push it up or push it down to like, you know, whatever part of the query. That is like my hand wavy simple brain definition. So in this case, I'm saying like, hey, let's, um, you know, we have like, you know, four, four of these basic values, you know, these, uh, you know, these, you know, start time, this start time and end time from, uh, you know, these particular timestamps. Let's actually, let's actually turn this into a table here. So there's a lot going on. I'm like, let's turn this into a table and we'll define, the, we'll call the table Z and we'll say like this, you know, this part of the tuple is a start time. This part of the tuple is an end time. You know, select all of it. Then we take we do the lateral join to the generate series function and say, all right, well for 400,000 times, you know, one to 400,000, you know, join this, you know, 400,000 times, bring it up to the select part of the query, and then say, okay, we'll take the x value that is, you know, returned from this function, and uh, you know, add the start time to it, you know, then you know, same thing, add the end time to it, using you know this x days interval, put into a range, and insert into bookings. Easy, right? Are we good? Maybe. All right. Well, here's the, so here's the semi-good news for this. This is just me trying to be fancy in terms of inserting test data that will never be used again. Um, but you know, the point is I just want to show off like, some of the functionality of Postgres because, believe it or not, like, some of these are going to reappear later in, you know, in the talk. So I just wanted like, us to get used to it in a kind of a contrived example. I'm also happy to make the slides available to everyone at the end of the talk, as well as the coding, uh, additional coding examples we will see. So let's run it. All right. So it inserted, you know, 1.2 million rows in about five seconds using some, you know, fancy SQL. And just to prove it, I don't want to do that. Okay, it's all there. Actually, let's actually look at the data, too. All right. So as you see, we have, a, you know, we have an incrementing primary key, and we have our ranges. And you know, sure enough, you know, we're actually seeing it in order, magically. Um, and we see, yeah, they're incrementing by day, and they're incrementing by time, and all is well with the world. It's the data that we expect. But this is still boring, because we just inserted data. We want to look up the data. So, no, so here's the thing. So the way B trees work are that, you know, they work on the standard equality and inequality operators. So equals, less than, greater than, greater than equals, et cetera. With ranges, we're going to get a whole new set of operators because we're going to need to be able to look inside the range or see if ranges overlap or see if ranges are next to each other. 
And we use all these like funny little symbols that we put together in order to do it. These funny little symbols cannot be indexed by B trees. So we need a new index type to do that. Now, some other databases might give up on that, say, like, all right, I'm done, you know, I'm, I'm gonna do whatever I want. Postgres said, no, like we're gonna create a specialized index for dealing with this kind of data. There's actually a few indexes that can do this. Um, we're first gonna start with the gist index. So gist indexes have been around for a while, and I believe they were first introduced to deal with full text search queries, but uh, Postgres historian can correct me on that. It stands for a generalized search tree, um, because basically it allows you to use a more generalized set of operators to work with it. Um, it's, a balance, it's basically a balanced tree, so kind of you know, similar to the B tree. Um, and the key is that it allows these arbitrary indexing schemes. Um, so, yeah, so basically you know, it can do things similar to B trees, it can also act more like R trees. Um, it allows you to do the, and the key things allows us to do this indexing on custom data types. It supports a lot more different operators, as I said, all funny looking things, but um, you know, for instance, you know, so this one's the distance operator. You definitely see this in PostGIS, which is the geospatial extension to Postgres. Uh, this is overlapping. These are, you know, do I have a value included in the range? Well, in the case of range types, or you know, do I have a range included within a range? Um, these are all related to, um, is my range like all the way to the left of another range? Or is it all the way to the left and overlapping a range, which I actually I use quite a bit in my career. And I do not remember what these are off the top of my head. But what, oh, intersection? Adjacent. Oh, adjacent. I thought, well, I thought adjacent was uh, like minus, two minus signs and this one, a pipe. Yeah, and they, and they could be, and like for different things, they could be mean different things too. But um, you actually, if you're using, if you're used PostGIS, you definitely see, we definitely see this one and this one a lot. Um, those are distance and overlapping are very important. Um, in full text search, you see, well, for full text search, you actually use some functions, which I think interface with those operators. <coughs> um, Let's see, just also supports, uh, I think it supports, there's some support for arrays with it. Um, I should have wrote it out, that was my mistake. Um, and the cool thing is you can actually implement your own indexing scheme. So basically, actually a lot of the data type authors that are in core Postgres that need to use these operators uh, interface with the, the just indexing and basically write their own index to it. And that's like the really cool functionality of Postgres. So if you decide that you want to implement your own data type, which actually you can do without recompiling the database, you can then implement your own indexing scheme to make sure you can efficiently take advantage of it and take advantage of all of the gist mechanics. So we're all going to do that right when we're done with this. Because we all love C. I do, actually I do like C. I'm just, oh, I did write it all out, of course. All right, uh, I do like C, but I'm not very good at it. Um, so gist works with full text search. I will say though, um, you want to use the gin index with full text search, which is outside of the scope of this talk. But essentially, the, the way I describe gin index is that it's a it's like a hash table, and it's like so 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 fast. It's basically used for uh, things where you need to introspect your data, such as like a JSON object or a full text search document. And I mean, it basically does it it does like constant time lookups. It is really fast. Um, just also works with arrays. Um, PostGIS. Actually, how many people use PostGIS? Cool. It's awesome. I was actually, I was just at Phosphor-G. It was such an awesome conference. Or I should say Phosphor-GNA. Like, I had such a good time. Um, so it also, so yeah, so basically you can work with geometric types. Trigrams. Uh, trigrams are basically, you, you use them if you're trying to write like an autocorrector or a spell checker. Um, it works well with those. And of course, ranges. Actually, one quick note on uh, geometric types. Uh, particularly points. So there's a, f a feature in um, the gist index, I think it was added in either 9.2 or 9.3. Well, let's say 9.3 because 9.2 is deprecated. I think it was added in 9.2 though. Basically you can do k nearest neighbor lookups, which are useful for saying like, hey, I'm at this point here. What are the five nearest Starbucks to the University of Ottawa? So as long as you have those points and you have the gist index there, you can basically in like, again, it's like, it's almost like a constant lookup. Say like, oh, here's all the five closest Starbucks. Awesome. Uh, very, very useful. I've used that in the real world. They are, those indexes get to be a little bit bigger, but you're, what you pay for like the index size, you gain in like lookup performance, and that's really what you need for it. So, Postgres ranges. Um, so,
Oh, okay, so basically we're going to use the gist index to do our range lookups. And let's do that. Yep. Is there no way to index with the overlap? There is. The gist index. <coughs> yeah. Oh, so, but the overlaps operator in this case is the and and that we're using with the range check. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. All right, so we're creating our gist index. And we do have, so, because we're indexing more operators, it's going to be a little bit larger, um, you, know, you know, especially this indexing scheme, so it's going to take a little bit more time, usually not this much time. Okay, there we go. And, um, and basically, if you want to see, you know, if you look at the size of the index, this is 93 megabytes, which is a little bit larger than our B tree. But again, um, you know, our data type, our range type is a little bit larger. larger. I believe these are 16 bytes for the timestamps. Um, and there are more operators involved, so you know, there's got, we need to do a little bit more you know, index path searching. Um, and actually, the, I actually have a thread on the hackers list about this particular data set with indexing schemes, which is outside the scope of this talk. But we, we actually kind of hit an, a little bit of an edge case with the, the data set that we generated here. That all said, we created the index, so let's do some lookups. And now, the most important lookup is, well, can we see if this room is booked at this given time? Let's see what happens. We can, and it's fast. It's like, you know, total, you know, total, you know, planning time, execution time is, you know, it took more time to plan than execute, which is pretty cool, which means if we have the statement already prepared, it's even faster. But, yeah, we use that index, and if we actually, you know, if we want to see what was returned, Cool. It turns out, yes, the room is booked from you know, 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. today for this talk. So it does return that data, and it returns it lightning fast. And that's really cool. Like, this is a really cool data type. Like I said, it literally changed my life. So what if we want to see if, um, let's say we want, we want to pull all the events for a given day. We can use, we can use that with, uh, you know, this is the uh, MI included in operator. I'm not sure. And I should say this is this operator here is the overlaps operator. So let's see. Can we get all the events in a given day in this room? Survey says yes, we can, and we can use the index. And you know, it's pretty fast. It's like you know, in this case, it was two milliseconds. I wonder. Let's see if we get. Yeah. So basically, part of it to you know, I probably should run it multiple times. Is let the data you know warm up the cache, and you know we can basically do the index lookups and you know in memory at that point because you know everything's been loaded into the cache. This is also a static system. So in a real system, you have things you know, swapping in and out of your shared buffer cache anyway. So again, your mileage may vary with performance. But the long story short is uh, yes, we can basically all those queries we're trying to do before. We can do them with the range types and use the index and get that performance lookup. So we're, you know, we're doing better now in terms of looking up things for the eventual calendar we're going to build. Um, and I'll actually just to prove you know, what data is returned. We have our, uh, our randomly ordered list, which happens to be in order of all the events for this given day. Cool. It works. So let's start architecting our application because it's mo the most important thing when we're writing software is to plan. You know, I had a, I had a professor in college who said, uh, it's, uh, minutes of planning saves hours of coding. I've taken that to me to this very day. So let's start. So how should we think about managing availability? Well, as I mentioned, you know, uh, you know, if we think about a space, you know, we, there's basically three statuses that can occur. You know, it can be closed. You know, nothing can book at all. It can be available, or it could be booked or unavailable. And the reason I separated it into three different things is that, you know, you could say, well, isn't closed technically unavailable? Well, one could say, yes, it is. But sometimes I like to open up, you know, I like to open up my space additional hours even when it's closed. So I want to be able to keep track of the difference between being closed, available, and booked. So yeah, that's, a, that's actually one of the little, one of the real world complications I did throw into this because I found it useful. Also, it's going to allow us to use prettier pictures, which you'll see in a moment. So ultimately, our, what, what's our calendar tuple? What are the things that we want to look up? 
we ultimately need to look up like what room we're in, what the status is, you know, closed, available, booked, and you know what range this all applies to, which is essentially, you know, is DMS 1150 available, you know, from you know 12:30 p.m. to 8 p.m. So let's start, let's start doing some pictures to visualize it, because I find a picture is worth, indeed, a thousand words. So let's take today. Let's start with nothing. We have no rules in our system. Basically, if we have no rules in our system, or maybe I've inserted one rule, basically I'm saying we're closed. We're closed from you know, midnight to midnight on this given day. So our range would be you know, TSTZ uh, 2018-530-00 we good? Basic range? Cool. Oh, God. The color came out awful. So that's supposed to be like a, like a lightish green on it. I don't know why it looks that bad. But basically, let's say, all right, we want to say that we can book anything between in, in DMS 1150 from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. or 20, 20, 100 hours. So that would basically give us a range of that time in that ugly green color that's really hard to see. Now let's say, you know, we know that there's two tutorials booked in this room today. There's one from 9 to 12.30, and there's one from 4.30 from 4 to 6.30, um, which is actually not true because I just made that up as an example. But, if, but yeah, so basically we now have two, we have two unavailability ranges, one from that first time, one from that second time. And if we put it all together, Ultimately, this is what our calendar should look like if we're representing it in range format. That we're closed from midnight to 8. Then uh, we have some availability from 8 to 9. Then from 9 to 12.30 p.m., we have a tutorial. From 12.30 to, what is it, 4 p.m., uh, we're available. Then from 4, from 4 to 6.30, we're unavailable. And then 6.30 to 8, we're available. 8 to midnight, we're closed. So ultimately, we're going to need to be able to create one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different ranges in order to get that full in a full gamut of the day. Be good with that. Cool. But the way I described it is that we only have you know these four range tuples. Because as we went through that process, all I said was, well, we know we're closed from here, we know we're available from here, and we know we know we're booked at these different times. And we could definitely do some math to every single time to be able to generate when, you know, what is our calendar. But I can tell you from experience that is a very inefficient lookup. We ultimately want to be able to turn these four ranges into these seven ranges. Because from a performance perspective, particularly for the end user who's looking at the calendar, we know, we've seen that we can look up ranges really quickly. But we're going to see that doing math around getting to you know, this, uh, this type of formula is going to take a little bit of work. So basically, on paper, hand-waving it, this is easy. But here's other things we need to consider. If we're trying to build a calendar, we need to divide up those ranges. And out of the box, Postgres does not deal with non-contiguous ranges. Operative word is yet, because I believe there's been, people have been trying to do some work on improving that. But you know, we need to deal with what is you know, Postgres 10, what is the stable release right now, not like some theoretical patch that doesn't exist. Um, we also just looked at availability from one day. If you think about it, we want to like you know open up a you know we want to op you know look at the entire calendar for DMS. Well, that could be like one giant range starting from midnight of today, going on to infinity because we can do uh, infinite ranges, and you could probably see from a, both a data perspective and a math perspective, it might be hard to look at like an infinite chunk of time. You know, in the real world, like I like to chunk things up by days for for a lot of different reasons, um, particularly because. I like to say, hey, show me all you know, my calendar for a given day. Also, what happens to data in the past? You know, as soon as you know, we don't care about you know, booking a room you know, on 529 unless you have a time turner. But if you don't have a time turner, you really don't care about that. So you know, we probably want to be able to archive all that data or do something with that. That's a real, you know, that's a real world concept. We're not going to deal with that here. And also data in the future. You know, how do I keep generating more account? You know, if I'm not dealing with infinite ranges, I'm only dealing with chunks day by day by day. I'm going to need to be able to you know, generate new chunks as we move into the future. How far in the future do I want to generate that data that has real-world performance ramifications? 
And also, like, I need to have something to keep generating that data in the future as time increases. So, you know, there's some real management things to consider. Also, you know, with bookings, we want to make sure that, you know, we don't double book. But in the real world, as I said, there are places where you do double book. I have a private room in a restaurant that seats 50 people. Well, I can have a party of 20 over here and a party of 25 over here. And maybe I can, like, allow, you know, a five top to come into it. Also, this is just for one space. As you see, you know, DMS 1150 is one of many rooms within, uh, within uh, the University of Ottawa, let alone the De Marche building. So there's a lot of things to consider in the re real world. And this is basically to say, oh, I, had a, I thought I had a little icon there, like the, the thing face emoji. This is basically to say, you know, there's a lot to consider here. And like we are, even though we are going to look at a smaller scope of the problem, there's still, you know, there's still a lot that we need to take into consideration. So I have been yammering for an hour, and this is originally where I thought I would do a short five-minute break if we need to stretch. Are we feeling like we need to get into this? Because after this, we're like, we're, we're going to be hitting it ha even harder. So let's take five minutes, because I know there's a lot of content coming up. And at 10.07, 10 we will uh, begin again. So I realize I have, you know, if we're doing the theoretical, you know, one minute per slide, um, I do have 90 slides left. Um, so let's, uh, let's hit this hard. So let's start designing our application. Um, so we're going we're gonna to start building out our schema because it's good to build out your schema. I am all for building out schemas. I'm not taking a dig at any schemaless databases at all. Um, so first we're going to start with a room. So room is very simple. And also I realized I, you know, I made annotations of the data types we're going to use, and I did not include the identity columns because this was from a previous talk. I'm sorry. But anyway, all the IDs where it says serial, let's switch it with identity columns. So room, we'll have a, you know, we're going to use surrogate keys. I don't want to do a surrogate key, uh, natural key debate. We're just using surrogate keys. And actually, the original application, you know, just speaking of, was actually written on top. You know, I had Django as my web interface to the database. But a lot of this functionality was captured within the database. And, you know, I just made it work with Django. But we'll, we'll get there. Um, so the room has a name. That's all. Then we're going to create something called the availability rule. Now, the availability rule is essentially what's going to allow us, th this is the managing our, whether or not we're open into the future. I basically, I'm going to take enough parameters that I would essentially either be able to have a script or a daemon or a program that's able to say, all right, we'll keep generating these rules 52 weeks into the future or 80 weeks into the future. Or remember I had a customer who's like, we need to have, you know, we do a lot of, you know, major life events. We need to have five years of availability into the future. Um, so, yeah, so basically, you know, we have a foreign key to the room because it needs to be associated with a room. We're going to have an integer array of the days of the week. Now, that's going to store, um, remember our ISO day of the week where Monday is 1 and Sunday is 7? That's what that's going to store, and that can store a collection of it because instead of having an availability rule for, like, every single day of the week, which is wasteful of space, we can take advantage of our, our integer array type and say, all right, well, this rule can apply from Monday through Friday. Because, for instance, maybe my operating hours Monday through Friday are always like 8 a.m. to, you know, 10 p.m. And, you know, Saturday we're going to stay open to 4 a.m. because we're going to get trumped. So um, that's probably an American term. But um, so then start time, end time. And notice we're using the time type here. Why? Because this is a generic rule. I'm saying that, all right, because on, on any given Monday or Wednesday or whatever it is, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., I'm going to be open. We don't need the timestamp there. In fact, we don't want the timestamp there because we're going to be generating like some generic information. You know, and our time type, I believe, is a little bit smaller. And then, how many weeks into the future, you know, do we want to generate it? Cool. Like I said, like the, you know, the, this is kind of a real-world application. You can build a calendaring system off this. I want it to be practical. So here is the SQL that does it. Why am I showing all of this SQL? Um, because we're going to run it. That's why. Also, uh, you know, just to point out some things here, um, I'm using a specific foreign key definition here. That's the references, you know, the table name, uh, and the, the column that I want to use as my foreign key. On delete cascade, what does that mean? By default in Postgres, if you have a foreign key, and I delete the parent, and I say, all right, uh, you know, I delete the room, it's going to bark and say, no, you still have data referencing it. Like, why are you deleting it? Don't do that. Like, that's, that's the point of, one of the points of a foreign key. It's a safety check. 
Um, if I say on delete cascade, I basically say, well, if I delete the room, then also delete you know, anything, you know, all the availability rules associated with the room. The reason I'm doing that is actually, this is it's primarily for uh, you know, um, exercise purposes because we're going to be deleting things a lot and I don't want to get that error. Um, in the real world, what I actually would do is I actually would not delete things. I'd have one additional column on it, I'd call it like is active or something. And basically, if the row was active, I would set that to true. And if I wanted to delete it, I would take that flag and set it to false. And I'd make sure my queries would not query it. With, I would say, Postgres 10 and really, you know, the upcoming Postgres 11, what I can do is I can create an archive table and basically run this, you know, basically use this, have this as a partition table where all my active rows are in one partition and all my inactive rows are in the other. Um, the other reason I try not to delete things is, uh, you know, one of it's for auditing purposes to see what actually is happening in the system. The other thing is, um, uh, you know, let's say the application code doesn't do what you think it's going to do and you start deleting things that you really don't want to delete and then, because of course you're taking backups and you have a point in time recovery available, you can go back to the point in time before you delete it and restore everything, right? So, I mean, you're kind of guarded against that, but then you also lose all the other good transactions that occurred in the same time. So, it can be a whole mess. If you can afford it, really, you probably don't want to delete things, but again, it's up to you. Long, so long story short, let's create our tables. And they're created, and they created validly. The other thing to note, too, is that when you do create a foreign key, you do get an index by default, which is pretty cool. And that's actually important to know, because a common mistake is you add a foreign key, and then you create an index to look up things specifically on your foreign key. So now you have two indexes doing the same thing, and that is, we call is, well, that is really bad. So don't do that. Also, and actually the way you can verify this, here's a fun command line trick. What do you call the table availability rule? No, that's, if you do backslash D, this is very intuitive, you basically get a printout of everything that's in the table and like indexes and other things that are associated directly with that table. And sure enough, here's your foreign key, which shows your foreign key constraint, which is basically using an index. Yeah. I know you didn't want to get into a, a physics key debate. Um, going back to your availability rules, I'm just wondering what would you consider the natural key on that? Would, is there a reason to have an ID there as opposed to just an ID? Do you have more than one? I mean, I think... I was going to say, I, I think, if you don't know what the natural key would be, I think it would be a combination of these four columns. That's what the natural key would be. Because that's what, that's, that's, you need those four things to uniquely identify it. Yeah, and sorry, and if I do something where I feel like, if you don't get it where I'm explaining this, like this, this was my life for six years, so if I'm getting, like, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm making assumptions and you're confused, please stop me. I'm more than happy to go into it. Um, all right, so these are the generic rules. But as we see, if we are going to just use generic rules to say when we're open, we're going to have to do a lot of math to figure out when we're actually open. And for the purposes of our user who are looking up our calendar, math is bad because math is slow. We want to be able to just say, like, oh, the math is already pre-computated, look things up. So that's what this availability table is. Basically, the availability table are all the rows that will be generated from our available, availability rule. And as we say, by default, we will be generating, well, 52 rows times the number of days of the week that we have in this given rule. So if we basically say um, we're creating a rule for you know, being open 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday, well, 5 times 52 gives us... 260 of these rules that we'll be generating. And basically, these rules get specific. So now we have, we're using our range type, the, the available range. So this would be, you know, specifically, let's say we generate a rule for today, it would be, um, you know, 5.30 from 8 a.m. to 5.30 at uh, 8 p.m. We're also storing the date here. And the reason I'm, I'm storing the date is uh, just for the convenience of lookup. Like, let's just say I'm going to look up uh, all the operating hours in the system on, you know, for May 30th. I may want to do that. It's more, it's more for convenience than uh, necessity. You could do everything with ranges, but um, the, 
that's called the application developer in me sometimes likes to just you know add a little bit of extra data to to make it easier. So, uh, yep. Did you consider some kind of uh, instantiated view for that availability? I did, um, and maybe the the missing piece of this talk was what I did before the punchline, which is we actually had a materialized view for the the final calendar. Um, Let's get through. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my experience with the materialized view. We did not have a good experience with it. I think it had to do with our data set. It probably could have been just my poor programming, but I'll explain why we actually, it, we, we, this actually led us to do, to build out the, the final 10 minutes of the talk, that materialized view. So before we create this table, there was actually, a, I had a digression about the SPGIS index, which I mentioned before. So SP just stands for Space Partition Generalized Search Tree. And actually, it was designed for dealing with unbalanced data, which is something you can often see with ranges. Um, so, when I, so actually, when I've originally given this talk, and actually in my real-world application, I use the SP just index. While preparing for this talk, I hit a, I basically hit a performance edge case, which I, I reported to the, the hackers list because it, you know, I couldn't actually build the SP gist index on this example. And it's probably because when I was generating the data for the example, like that, you know, those 1.2 million rows, it was actually, I was actually generating it in a balanced way because it was constantly increasing. In a real scheduling application, while, you know, time does sort of constantly increase because, you know, we keep moving into the future, we don't have time turners, you tend to insert the data kind of randomly, though, because, you know, maybe, you know, you know, picking on, you know, David, like, you know, he's generating, you know, he generates, you know, some data, you know, he inserts a booking to May 31st, but then I insert a booking for May 30th, and, you know, and then, you know, Michael inserts a booking for, you know, 6-2. But even though, like, it is sort of, like, increasing over time, it's still being inserted in an unbalanced way, because, you know, we're, you know, we're inserting the information randomly. And, you know, that's why I never really hit that issue in production. Um, I didn't, so, normally I was going to do a demo about how to use SPGIS indexes, but, I couldn't because I hit this edge case with it. And, you know, of course, I'm writing the tutorial at the last minute, so I didn't, you know, I didn't get to write the correct one. But mostly I want to sh throw out that there's this thing called SPGIST, and it's definitely worth looking at at your own time. And it's actually very, like, we had really good performance using the index in the, in the real world. So this is not to, I, I just want to make sure to say, like, this actually is a really useful tool. I'm sorry, I can't actually demo it. So... The other lesson for that is always test your indexes before you put it into production to see what makes the most sense for your, for your data set. It, there's a little bit of an art to index selection. So anyway, here's our table uh, for the availability rules. Um, and we're going to create, we're going to use a gist index on our available ranges because as you recall, we're going to need to be able to look up our ranges fairly quickly and we saw that we are able to get good performance with our data using uh, the gist index for looking, up, looking it up on ranges. All right, so everything creates. All right, now, of course, maybe arguably the most important thing, we need to be able to book our room, and that's what this unavailability table is for. And it's actually very simple. It says, I have an unavailable date, I have an unavailable range, and I have a room ID. You know, the range, of course, is our range. You know, we're booked right now from, you know, 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. That's our range, and it's the very specific range of being on uh, May 30th. And again, the date is just there for convenience. You know, for instance, I want to be able to look up all the, all the bookings within a given day. We're also going to put a gist index on the unavailable range because, again, we need to be able to do those fast range lookups, particularly, as you see, when we're generating our calendar. Everything's created. Last but not least, I lied. This table is the most important table. Because this is the table that's going to let us basically build a calendar where we can look up things very, 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 very quickly. So we call it calendar. It's associated with room ID. Uh, it has, it's basically, it keeps track of our status. In this case, I call the status is available, unavailable, and closed. And um, it has a date because the date, here's where the date is actually very useful because while I keep showing these really fast range lookups, it's still faster to do, uh, you know, an equals lookup on a given date because it's, you know, a smaller data type. Um, it's a discrete value and we, you know, we can find it in the index really quickly. And then of course we have the range. 
So we called like we showed what, what our availability tuple was earlier, where we need to know what room we're in, what the status of that room is, and you know, what, how long that status applies to in their room. This is that tuple. We're going to be storing that information in this table. And this is going to be able to let us to do you know, these really fast lookups. Um, No, and here's why. Because this is not, for the purposes of this exercise, we are not going to need that. Um, in the real world, so in the real world, let's talk about that after, just because I, I, know, I know your application. In the real world, it's a much more complicated table. Anyway, um, TLDR. For this, uh, so basically for this table, I actually use the multi-column index because often when I'm looking, you know, this was really just to say I want to look up the calendar. Like I just want to see all the bookings within, or bookings open and closed within, um, you know, this given calendar day. And, you know, we can use the multi-column index here because we have a room and we know that a room is going to have a lot of different calendars. So I can actually, you know, take advantage of the multi-column index there, that on the date. We actually could probably create a gist index on this too. Um, but, eh, you know, this works. What is, what is the date in that table? The date represents, um, that, that would be correct. Because we're, we're basically going to be logically chunking our calendar by a given date. So we know that uh, nothing is ever, so even if I'm booking a room, let's say, from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m., I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut off the calendar at midnight. So that way, that booking from, you know, basically, we, th you'd see a booking within two chunks. You'd see it from 11 p.m. to midnight, and then the next day, midnight to 1 a.m. That's just, that's me as an application architect saying, I want to do it this way. And you have two rows for that example? Correct. We actually, I purposely made sure we did not hit that example in this talk, but the code does account for that example. <coughs> yes? Sorry. It's okay. Um, I could. I could. And actually, it's funny. So there's a way to do something called exclusion constraints in Postgres where I can say, make sure like these two rows, like, it's a little bit more complex way of doing like a unique constraint. It's basically saying these two rows don't overlap. In the real world, I had something like that, but it was too good. And there are cases where you do want to double book. So I did not, so I removed that. And also, I want to make sure there's enough time to get to the punchline of the talk. So yeah, could, could I put a guardrail in there? Absolutely. So I, I, I could do a check constraint, for instance. Um, maybe in the next version of this talk, I will do that. Cool. So anyway, we've created all of our models. So great, we're done, right? No, because this is just you know this is just the schema. There's a lot of business logic here that we need to create. You know, for instance, we need to generate the initial calendar. When I create a room. I want to make sure I can create enough. I basically need to be able to say, all right, I have a room. Well, I don't have any rules around it, so I'm always closed. So I need to create you know, rules to say I'm closed for the next, you know, our default, which is 52 weeks. Um, we also need to generate you know, some availability rules. And when we create those rules, be able to generate all of the different individual availability chunks off of those rules. And of course, like, we, want to, you know, we want to insert some bookings as well. So this is this is uh, this is the fun part. Let's build an application. So to do this, though, we're actually going to be able to build everything within Postgres to you know to build and manage and keep our information in sync. But we're going to cover a few topics in order to get there. And this was actually you know when I was first giving this talk, this was I was like, well, this is really a lot where the tutorial is because. In order to build this, there's a lot of advanced features of Postgres that you know one needs to take advantage of. So we'll be we'll be looking a little bit more at that generate series function that uh, we saw. We're going to be writing some recursive queries. Did you know that you can do recursion within Postgres? It's a way you know within SQL itself you can loop through things, which is pretty cool. There's also um, you know we're also going to cover SQL functions, uh, including set returning functions. And then if you don't like recursion, there's actually a programming, you can actually use uh, iterative programming languages within Postgres, including the built-in uh, PLPGSQL, and then triggers, because we need to keep everything in sync, and triggers do that. And we can get into a whole trigger debate later, because that's actually part of the, we actually will get into that, because that's the point of the talk. 
So this was originally why I planned for our first break, um, but I realized that didn't make sense. Moving on. Generate series. So as I joked before, you, most often when you see generate series, you see it for generating test data. But actually, I'd say you know, a, really, you know, a really nice thing about generate series is that it actually helps generate missing data. So let's take reporting, for instance. You know, let's say you need to report all the sales for a given month. And, you know, and you, let's say you don't have any sales on you know, May 29th. It was just a slow day. Well, if you were just to generate the report, you know, point blank, you know, just using the data from the database, you'd have a gap in the report. Like, you would never see, you know, May 29th show up. Because, of course, you cannot account for the absence of data in a database. But with generate series, what you could do is I could say, hey, select from generate series, uh, you know, my interval of, you know, May 1st to May 31st increment by one day, left outer join, you know, sales on the given dates, and then aggregate it up, and sure enough, you'd see May 29th there, and it, you know, some total of zero. So it's really, it's a really useful function. It's more than just generating a lot of BS data that you know causes you to send bug reports to the hackers list. It actually does you know, useful applications. And here, you know, for for our calendar application, we're going to use it to help you know, you know we'll basically bootstrap our calendar. Um, we'll be able to quickly generate our, you know, our close blocks or our, you know, availability rules. The key thing about this too is, you know, and, you know, I think I handled this before is that it's a set returning function. That it doesn't return one value, it returns a set of values, which allows you to perform, you know, the various uh, database operations on it, such as joins. So, just for fun, because we have, I guess, you know, we haven't done a, a date generating function yet. So generating a series of dates. Using that function, hang on, I probably should like show it off for one more second. Select you now from generate series, you know, two date ranges on an interval of one day. I generated all the dates for the year. So now I could break down my sales report by every single day of the year. One thing to, actually just to prove it, as you see, everything generates. All right, recursion. Um, since Postgres 8.4, you've been able to do recursive queries. Who has actually used recursion within Postgres? Cool. So uh, the reason uh, Mr. Federer is very excited is that he was a big proponent for getting uh, this feature in. And actually, Postgres was, uh, I think Postgres was the first database to have recursive queries. And then definitely the, when we SQL Server, and then a, but we did, we did writable, didn't we do writable? writable. Yeah, we did writable uh, queries first, uh, writable CTEs. Anyway, um, so basically with the syntax with recursive, which you put at the very top of your query, the recursive flag lets you turn on the ability to do recursive queries. You need to have to find a base case and a recursive case. That's straight out of math. Um, important thing to note is that We'll see some of these queries come in that you need to, you know, the way you separate your base case from your recursive case is with union. If you use union all, you basically say, I want, you know, the full results of the query to come out. Like, you essentially, even if there's uh, duplicate rows, it will return those duplicate rows. Union will eliminate the duplicates. And actually, I use this to speed up queries that I was running in the real world, where, like, I need to eliminate duplicates, and I was running a distinct after. There was, I was paying that cost penalty for running a distinct at the very end. When I was unioning as I went along the iterations, it greatly sped up those queries. Like we had a, like, I think it was like one case, like a 100x performance boost. So yeah, it was, yeah, <laughs> that's why I, I wanted to point that out. Um, like, all good re, like all good recursive queries, you can hit infinite loops. And in this case, like you can actually hit infinite loops. Um, I did have safeguards in our production code where I said, well, if we're looping more than, you know, you know, depending on what it was. Like, let's say I'm looping more than 50 times, just like exit out of the recursive case because something is wrong. Um, of course, the better fix could be not, uh, <laughs> you know, not writing code that can uh, recursively loop, but there could be real world cases. Well, basically, the real world case I would have is that I'd have, you know, I'd have a hierarchical table, and someone would say, all right, we'll point this row at this row, but then point this row at this row, and then doing. And then we do a recursive descent on it, and it would be like doing this, 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 this. So um, it's, good, it's good to break out your infinite cycles. The code examples you're going to see are going to assume that we're perfect, and uh, we're going to be able to break out of a recursive case. We'll always be able to break out of our recursive cases. 
So let's build a recursive function. So I chose to use a factorial. Hey, guess what? Now you can do factorials in Postgres. And there's probably, I actually do this with uh, window functions too, but um, I decided to do it this way. So what does it say? So we have, um, you know, starting up here, you know, we're going to store a factorial in a variable called n, and we're, recur we're going to basically keep track of how deep we are uh, using a variable called i. So this is our base case, because we're going to start with 1. And then we say, all right, well, here's our recursive case. We're going we're gonna to select from our factorial table. This is our, our, our recursion right here. And as long as you know, i plus 1 is less than or equal to 100, uh, we're going to uh, calculate the factorial. And we're also going to increment i. Pretty simple. So basically, this is hard coded to say calculate 100 factorial. And then, you know, and basically to prove that we're running 100 factorial, instead of just selecting n, I also select uh, our iterator. So let's see if it works. Who thinks 100 factorial is going to blow up my machine? Actually, I should I should have picked something to blow up the machine specifically. Um, sure enough, it works. And actually, in this case, it was a you know I didn't say return 100 factorial. I said return every single step along the way, so we can see how quickly everything grows. And by the way, that ran pretty fast too, which is awesome. Postgres is awesome. I mean, obviously I'm biased, but <laughs> cool. Next step. All right. In this case, um, oh, is this one going to blow up my machine? Let's find out. Yes, because I never cancel out of, you know, if you look at it, I never, you know, if you look over here, I never canceled out of the recursive case. I never said, like, run 100 factorial or anything. I just said, keep iterating, iterating, iterating. And sure enough, in this case, we overflowed. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, actually, the good news is we overflowed because we had a numeric overflow. Basically, our numeric got so big, and that's really that blows my mind because the numeric data type is gigantic in Postgres. But yeah, we hit the numeric overflow. If I did not hit that numeric overflow, we would still be iterating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be very careful. Like again, this is one of these things with great power comes great responsibility. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Cool. So in this case, this you know, in this case, I said, you know, instead of having you know this set returning, well, a set returning table of all factorials, find the actual 100 factorial. In this case, I was lazy and I said pick the max because I know in this case the max will be 100 factorial. And sure enough, it's going to do it. We get the one row, and it's pretty fast. Sorry. All right. Cool. Now, here's the one thing, though. If we're thinking about a factorial function, uh, sorry. Sorry, in the case where you remove your where statement, mm -hmm. uh, you hit uh, an overflow. Yeah. But is there a match between that that you would eventually hit had you not hit the overflow? I think there's a setting for max recursion depth, but I've actually not, in the real world, I've not hit it. I've just had infinite loops. And basically getting you know alerts saying, hey, your database is using all its CPU. What's going on? Um, that's why I always say, you know, Postgres is a, is a great system, but I also trust making sure I have my guards in place to like not loop the system. So, yeah, I would, I would. This is there, there's sometimes where I'm, you know, I, you know, again, I say this as a self-deprecating application developer. There's sometimes I trust the application developer more because at least I know the code is there. All right. So the cool thing is that we're doing these factorials and we're using recursion in Postgres. The bad thing is, you know, every single time I'm hard coding, you know, which factorial that I want. And I'd like to be able to do this in a more scalable way because as an application developer, I do like being able to make things generic and then like handing it off and not needing to worry about it. So we can do this with functions. Who's used functions in Postgres before? Cool. Functions are, this could actually be a very long story. So I'm going to try and do a long story short. Um, functions are a great way, you know, in any programming language to, you know, capture repeated behavior. Because, you know, writing the same thing, copying, pasting over and over is terrible. And I hope nobody does that in here. 
Postgres 11 introduces something called stored procedures, which basically one of the big advantages with those is that you can actually do transactions inside the function. Up until Postgres 11, you know, you can run, you can have a function existing inside of a transaction, but you can't do anything transactional. Well, you can't run separate transactions inside the function. Um, this is all changing in Postgres 11. I can't wait to see the kind of code, or the kind of systems people are able to write with that. Like, my mind's already, like, racing for things I want to build because of it. Um, what can SQL functions do? Well, they have a lot of properties. If you go to the documentation page on, you know, with the create function syntax, there's a lot you can see there. And I, I want to summarize a few things. Um, first, uh, you know, functions can have input and output. Duh, that's like math. Um, volatility. This is actually very important. Um, there's three volatility types, immutable, stable, and volatile. And all affect the ability, how, you know, basically how the function is used in the query planner, which can basically affect performance. Volatile is the default type. So if you don't, throw, if you don't set the volatility type, it will be volatile, and volatile will perform the worst. Now, volatile you need if you're doing a write operation inside the function. But if you're doing only reads, let alone only calculations, and you don't set your volatility type, like, your, you know, your code will execute more slowly, and you're going to be like, you know, oh my god, SQL functions suck in Postgres, why am I using this? Um, you use stable if you're basically doing, the way I summarize stable is if you're using a select query where you're reading data from the table, you can use stable. Basically, what the stable type says is that, you know, within the context of my transaction, you know, my data won't change. So if I'm calling this function repeatedly, know that, um, you know, the underlying, you know, the underlying table won't change for, you know, this for this transaction. Immutable basically says my, you know, immutable is immutable. It's my data will never change. So something like something like a factorial could be an immutable function because every basically my based upon my input, my output is never going to change, based upon that input. Parallel safety. This was added in 9.6. So since 9.6, Postgres has been, uh, uh, been uh, supporting parallel query. So the default for this is a function is parallel unsafe. But if you're pretty sure a function is parallel safe, like a factorial, you can mark it as parallel safe, which is what I do in these examples. Um, I don't believe my immutable factorial function that we will write, or I will write, will um, be able to take advantage of parallelism, but I'm marking it as parallel safe because I think it's just good, for example, purposes to get that concept out there. Um, it's also a leak proof and security definer. If you're working with row level security, which is a topic, well, row level security was introduced in Postgres 9.5 and is a topic way out of scope for this talk. Um, if you know the function's not leak proof, basically it's not going to like let you, you know, steal information or, you know, put information in a place where it shouldn't be. You can mark it as the function is leak proof. Security definer basically says, you know, you can execute this function as a particular user within the system. These are two things that are very important if you're writing applications that need to have security in it, which should be everything that you write in production. So you should be very familiar with them. Um, you might not need row level security for production. That is like a whole different level of security, but it's there. Execution cost. If you really want to play with the query planner and try to optimize things and you, know, you think you're smarter than the defaults, which maybe you are, you can actually set what you think the execution cost of the function is, which will help for query planning purposes. Which is pretty cool. I've actually never done that. Maybe I should have. And then you can also say uh, what language the function is going to be in, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, because it doesn't have to be in SQL. So let's create a function. So you know, as I as I complained, you know, that recursive factorial function we had was not generic. It was hard coded to a hundred. In this case, we can say, hey, run any factorial. So the basic thing is, you know, here, you know, I basically have a function definition. I take an input, integer of n. Um, basically, I say that, you know, calculate, you know, whatever factorial. It's the same function as before, but um, I basically have this variable substitution here. Um, the default way to substitute variables in Postgres functions is a dollar sign and the positional argument. So in this case, this is, you know, dollar sign one. And then, you know, as before, as we saw in that final example, you know, we take the max value from that calculation, and that's what we're going to return. So let's create this function. Cool. And it worked. Interesting fun fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and that's come up on the Postgres session. And the case would be is if you 
have, you could have an immutable function that's actually writing to temporary tables um, to, as part of its calculation. And as a result of that, it's not parallel state because it's actually performing these runs. So um, you do need the combination of possibly being parallel and safe. And using the but little aside, but I found it interesting. Cool. This was a fun fact from Michael Glazman. All right, so as you see, you know, running our you know, factorial functions. I still can't believe like the 10,000 factorial executes that quickly. And let's see if we can even see a number. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the matrix. <laughs> they go, wow, so like half, like half a second, like holy shit. That's pretty cool. So just for fun, you know, here's the, you know, let's look at the a query plan. And again, we're not seeing much because a lot of, you know, I mean, one, it's, you know, we're essentially doing a, you know, an order one operation because we're you know we're doing a calculation. Well, really, it's not. You know, it's the you know it's the big O. It's big O of you know calculating a factorial. Um, but also the magic is hidden within the function. So the query planner is like, all right, well, you're calling a function, and all right, good luck. All right, let's see what else we do. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm just gonna hand wave this one. Um, so remember, like the original, the original call we had was a, you know, we basically returned the set of every factorial from you know one to n, where n, this, where n was a hundred. We can actually turn that into a function as well. Um, so basically, we, ba you know, the big difference is that when we give our return type, we give a return set of numeric, and yeah, you know, I'll just, I'll just run it real quick. It's like tldr. It works. It's that fun, you know, you know it's, it's, it's the same thing as before. Now it's, you know, functionized. Now, there's another thing where we can actually return tables. Basically, we can define specifically what, um, you know, what values are being returned in it. And the, this is a very basic example, but the reason I point this out is that um, Postgres, the Postgres functions, there's a data type you, re, you can return called record which is essentially a generic record or a generic row that you can return. So if I need to return you know, tuples of information, which is actually you know, very useful in you know, some real world applications, including this one, um, you can do that. The problem is that is often you know, a set of record is not necessarily optimized and, you know, because it's basically saying every single time, oh, I'm getting some generic information. I don't necessarily, you know, I'm going to have to basically build out this tuple every single time. Table allows you to you know, specify what that tuple will look like. And we're seeing, the reason I wanted to point this out is in some of the examples coming up with building our actual application, we are going to see, uh, you know, we're going to see that specifically, uh, specifically using table. So while this one performs very similarly to the set of function, I just want to point out that we can get specific about, you know, set returning, you know, basically table returning functions, and you can, you know, specify the attributes that are returned with it. So we're gonna we're gonna trust that this all works, and of course I've lost my mouse. All right, procedural languages. So I actually, sorry, I want to check what slide we're on, and I can't find my mouse. There we go. Okay, procedural languages. Okay, Postgres, the extensible database, can use languages beyond SQL. Um, basically, it has this thing called the procedural language loader. It's been around since version God knows when. Um, I think I was still in middle school when that came out. Um, I'm a little bit older than I look, too. Um, and basically, you can execute iterative languages or imperative languages or essentially any language that's been interfaced with the procedural language loader. Fun fact, you, when you one, so Postgres has something called PGSQL, which was, is similar to PLSQL and Oracle, similar but different. Um, but that was not the reason why it was written. It was basically written because uh, Jan Weick, who uh, built the procedural language loader, wanted to run Tickle inside, his Postgres, inside Postgres. So Tickle was the first language supported by, you know, built in by uh, PL, then PGSQL, then Perl and Python. There's also others you can add on. Uh, JavaScript is very popular. That's actually, you have to look up PLv8. Um, it actually executes scary fast. Uh, R, R, R is also very popular as well. <laughs> Um, and there's a bunch of others out there. There's actually a couple of new ones, JVM and Container. Uh, Lol code was very popular April 1st one year, but it does, you can actually run Lol code within your Postgres, like hi there, i is in your loop, and all those fun things, and a bunch of others. This is awesome. Um, in production, I have used PGSQL, so PLPGSQL and PLPython. 
The examples in this talk will be using uh, PLP GSQL because it's easy and let's all learn a new language anyway. Um, but yeah, it's cool. Actually, how many people have used procedural languages in Postgres? Cool. Nice. So here's an example of PLP GSQL. Um, the first thing we have to do is uh, create the, you know, basically load it into our database if we've not done so already, which we can use with create extension. Um, so in this function, we're, go we're basically going to, uh, we're going to use um, PLP GSQL to implement our factorial function. So that way we don't have to use recursion. In fact, um, you know, probably like all the different language constructs in PLP GSQL are a tutorial in themselves. Just going through it real quick, you know, you do need, if you're using variables, you need to declare them in a declare block. Um, assignment is this, is the dot equal syntax because equals is used to test for equality. Um, and you can, you know, you can do loops in it, you can do ifs, you can do um, a lot of things. You can return. But in this case, you know, we've reduced our recursive query from, you know, that giant with, you know, with, you know, select block to four, i, and one, you know, up to n. Do the factorial and return it. So, just to prove that it all works. Sweet. Pretty fast. Actually, let's do the fun one. Pretty fast, and actually, if you remember, um, our recursive one ran, you know, ran in about 400 milliseconds. This one ran in 100 milliseconds. So, in this case, you know, we don't we don't need to warm up the cache because it's all compute. So, there are some cases where, yeah, PLP GSQL will outperform SQL, and, you know, vice versa. You need to you need to test all your different examples. Cool stuff. All right, so, and I think, yeah. triggers. All righty, who has used triggers just in any database, not just Postgres? Cool, so we are familiar with what they are. But just for, you know, just for the purposes of definition, um, basically triggers are, basically triggers, that's actually incorrect. Triggers execute functions that can be called before, after, instead of an operation or an event. And Postgres is, has basically two sets of triggers. There are data changes, data change triggers, which is probably what most people are familiar with, which are, you know, insert, update, delete. But there's also event-based triggers for things that can happen, you know, on the structure of your database. So, you know, creating tables, for instance, you know, doing, making a DDL change, or, you know, adding, you know, granting permissions to a user in the system, you know, a, a DCL change. And that's actually pretty cool because you can have, it's, it's almost meta, like, you know, I can, you know, basically I can track changes that are going on within my database and, you know, do something with them. A common example for that is auditing. Like, I want to audit that, you know, Mr. Federer is creating a bunch of tables in my database, and, you know, and then, you know, he, and then he teamed up with Michael, who's like, you know, using immutable functions to put stuff into temporary tables. So I, now I got all that audited now, and they're being sneaky. Um, triggers are atomic, which is really important. So if I'm running, you know, if I'm running my code within a transaction, which by default Postgres, you know, even if you don't explicitly say begin, Postgres, you know, every single line is a transaction within Postgres. In order for that transaction to commit, you know, the trigger must either execute cleanly or say, you know, I'm not, I don't want to execute this trigger. Um, if there's an error in your trigger, which is, you know, probably the pain of most triggers, uh, you know, the transaction will fail. Um, you know, just, you know, syntax-wise, a trigger, when you're defining a trigger function, um, it must return either a, a type of trigger or event trigger. Uh, you can return null if you want to skip, you know, if you want to skip the operation. And a common, a common trigger gotcha in Postgres is dealing with uh, old and new, which we'll see in a second. So old is your, you know, basically what, what your, your record is before, before the, if, if, you're, if, you're make, if you're making a change, old is, you know, the state of the data before, particularly in an update, and new is the state of the data after, after the change. Um, a common gotcha is that people try to do a catch-all and they, you know, and they return either new for every single thing or return old for every single thing. Well, old is not defined in insert because, because, you know, if you're inserting new data, your old data is null because it never existed. So if you're returning, if you return old, you cancel the trigger. 
The bigger gotcha is usually in delete, because in delete there is no new. The old change is your old data before you delete. The new is uh, your, you know, is null because you're deleting it from the database. Typically, you know, people, you know, you might get lazy and just return new regardless of the change. You can't do that with delete because your row might not actually delete if you want to, you know, if you're intending for it to delete. But anyway, we're never going to delete our data because we know that we're just going to set it to inactive and put it into a partition. Um, so they can actually trigger, trigger functions and execute once per modified row or once per SQL statement. And clearly, there's, you know, if you're able to get away with it, there's advantages to being able to execute it once per SQL statement. Unfortunately, in my line of work, I was never able to take advantage of that, so I would have to execute one trigger per row, which you're going to see is going to come and bite us later. Um, if you have multiple triggers defined on the same table for the same, you know, for you know, something like an insert, they execute in alphabetical order, which if you need, you know, if you need changes to occur in a particular order, well, one, you probably should have them all in one trigger function anyway. But if you don't, for whatever reason, know that gotcha, because that could end up biting you hard. The cool thing is that um, you can use any PL language that uh, has uh, interfaced with the, the trigger interface. So I know uh, PHP SQL you know, does support it. That's what we'll be using. Uh, so do, I know Perl and Python definitely support it as well. I believe R does too. Um, there's probably others. But that's nice. So if you're much more comfortable writing Python versus uh, PLPGSQL, hi right, Python. Uh, some common things to know. So we discussed new and old. Um, TGOP. Uh, so so basically, so first of all, these are these are variables that are available within your trigger functions you know, when they're executing. So TGOP basically tells you what operation uh, you are using. Uh, TG name, you know, name of the trigger fired. Uh, you know, you can get your table name, schema name. Also, like when it's being fired, is it before the changes, after the changes? That could affect your trigger behavior. And also, is it a row-level trigger or a statement-level trigger? Pretty cool. Most in most of my uh, most of my practitioner days, I use new, old, and TG op. Um, I never had to use TG when. Again, like part of this is your your architecture design for how you do it. TG op I found very useful because I was able to keep, you know. Particularly if I was, uh, I wrote a trigger for you know, changes on a table, I was able to keep everything in one function, which is much nicer, particularly when debugging. So let's write some triggers. Let's do an example trigger. Um, so basically what I did is I created two tables. Um, they were, they're, uh, how do I describe it? So basically, this is a completely contrived example. But I just wanted to show how triggers could work. So I have two tables, one where I store a name and like a secret, which I believe is randomly generated, and then a table B that whenever, I, basically I want whenever I make a certain kind of changes in table A, then I have these records in table B that also just have like secrets in them. Like I said, it's a really stupid example because the, the fun examples are going to come shortly. Um, let's create that. Actually, when I, when I do post the slides, I probably should add a note, like, that's a really stupid example. But anyway, so here I write a trigger function. And basically what I want to do here is um, what, I'm basically tracking changes that occur in, our, in table A. First thing I want to do is I want to be able to generate a secret every single time that uh, I'm inserting a row in that table. And the secret is going to be a combination of the primary key uh, concat concatenated to a last name that's inserted, concatenated to the current timestamp, and then do a SHA-512 hash and encode it in hexadecimal. Why? I don't know. But the idea is that I, you know, I don't want the application interfacing with this to be generating the secret. I just want to show that I can do it in PL, PGSQL. It's an, like as a contrived example. Um, the one thing is that where I've, you know, in the real world where I've done this is actually um, actually generating uh, timestamp ranges. Basically, I've used triggers to say, well, I know I have a date, I know I have a time, and you know, I, you know, I have you know, a start time and an end time. Combine them all together into a timestamp and insert into the database. The reason that I've done that is that sometimes it's difficult to uh, create you know, you know, timestamp ranges based upon the driver you're using uh, for your application code. So I break this up into uh, two separate parts in the trigger. 
The first is, you know, if it's an insert, well, insert all these rows into table B that basically um, make a secret based upon uh, I, which I'm storing in IV. Like, I kind of borrowed it. I don't, I don't know. Like I said, it's stupid. And then whenever we update, uh, again, we regenerate the secrets for B. So, all right. Like I said, it's completely stupid, but let's just create it. Now, the thing is, we've, all we've done now is define the trigger function. We've not defined any triggers yet. It's a two-step process. So we're going to create two, two separate triggers. The first is a before insert trigger. And basically, it says, you know, before insert for each row, so it's a row level trigger, uh, execute the procedure, the procedure async trigger. Easy enough, no conditions. Now, the reason I separated it out is that on updates, I only, you know, I basically said, all right, in my application, I only need to update the secrets if the last name changes. So I, I'm able to put a condition on the trigger, which says, you know, create trigger before update on the table for each row when the old name is different from the, the new last name, execute the trigger. Very interesting function here, or sorry, operate here, is distinct from. So, nulls. Nulls are very interesting in Postgres because a null is nothing. If you do, if you do a comparison, null, comparisons with nulls can break your application in weird ways. Is distinct from is a way of, ba basically this is a fancy way of saying does not equal but it accounts for dealing with equality comparisons with null. Because, as I said, the long story short is null can do some really weird things. But if, like, this is null and this is, you know, A, this will be able to say, like, oh, like, null is distinct from A. Like, something has changed. This is, you know, go ahead and, you know, execute this. And that's actually really important in triggers because um, we often deal with nulls there, and we don't want to have to say, we don't, basically this simplifies saying, like, well, if O that last name is not null, and new that last name is not null, and old that last name does not equal you know new that last name, you know, or old that last name is null, and new that last name is not null, or old that last name is not null, new that last name is null. That basically simplifies all that, and this is distinct from a uh, uh, comparison. Sorry, that was a big digression. So, right, we created some triggers. So first off, we have nothing in table A, nothing in table B. We run, we're going to insert my last name into table A. So we see that the trigger fired, and it generated this really long secret. And... We also see that the trigger inserted data into table B with a bunch of secrets with a bunch of, you know, the, the I values. Cool. Now let's see if that check constraint actually works. Let's say I run an update and I say, you know, update my last name. You know, does it, you know, does it update the timestamps? The answer is no. That's still, you know, it's still the 11 a.m. and 31 seconds timestamp. So it did not fire the trigger. Or sorry, it did fire. It did fire the trigger, but actually, it did not fire the trigger because our check constraint said you know, only if the last name changes, and the last name did not change. But let's, you know, let's update the timestamp. So we explicitly update the timestamp, and well, it did change in table A. But it did not fire. We didn't because we didn't hit the check constraint. Well, we didn't we didn't pass the you know that one constraint. So it didn't update the timestamps in uh, table B, which is part of what we did in our update clause in uh, the trigger, in the trigger function. But if we do if we do update the last name, sure enough. All right. Well, it did update. Timestamp did update. And table B, um, it might be hard to tell because it's all a bunch of mishmash, but uh, all the secrets updated, and we can see that all the timestamps did update. So a trigger does work. Yay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. 
All right. So let's build something real. So recall our data structure. We all we all remember this, right? But you know, just you know, just to give a brief recap. So we have our rooms. We have stuff to generate when our rooms are open, and we have stuff to generate when our rooms are booked. And then we ultimately aggregate that in a table called calendar, so our users can quickly look up the availability of a given room. So the goal is that we got to keep all of these things in you know in sync. All right, so first things first, uh, we need to have a trigger for, so I should also say, we're going you know, to build this up with you know, all the tools we've learned over the past hour. So first, we need to you know, have a, our, our room, whenever we insert a room, we need to be able to insert all of the information about its operating, default operating hours, which is that they're closed. And we're going to do that over you know, the course of, a, of 52 weeks, because that's what we decided as our default. So ultimately, if we scan this code real quick, that's exactly what it does. And maybe one of the key trigger-specific things is that we have this new.id here. So the new.id, that's basically the primary key that has now been generated for our, uh, for our room record being inserted. And we can basically associate that with the, foreign, you know, with the room ID foreign key in our calendar table. And the rest of it is you know, basically around our defaults. You, know, you can see that we have our generate series function, so we can generate a year's worth of... Uh, you know, a year's worth of availability for that given day. Um, we, we increment by one day, so we're actually inserting um, 365 rows. And anything else special? Huh. This, is, you know, this, is, this is that default availability tuple. So let's create that function. And then uh, we're going to create that trigger. And again, we're only going to, we're only going to do this on insert. Um, we're not going to do it on update because really, you know, as you saw in our room table, we only have two things. We have an ID and we have our room name. And none of our availability is affected by the room name. Of course, if we change the ID, it would be affected by it. But we're not modifying our primary keys. And probably if we really want to be thorough, we'd have something to account for that. But we're not because we're not. Um, and we don't need to do anything on delete because on our foreign keys we did the on delete cascade. So if we deleted the room, automatically everything's going to delete that's associated with that room. It's going to have this cascading effect. Very quick way to delete everything in your database, by the way. Cool. All right, so now that trigger is installed. We're not going to test it out because just yet because first we're going to start, you know, we're going to... Uh, there's a few more things we need to insert into uh, the table before we test it. Otherwise, we're going to get some, like, a weird state of data. All right. Now, availability rules. So recall the availability rule table is going to help us generate when we're open, you know, you know X days into the future. You know, we give it the, the, a set of days of the week, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and a set of operating hours, like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We also say, you know, generate it, you know, 52 weeks into the future. That's our default. So what do we do here? Um, so the most important thing, well, we're going to need to do two things. One, we're going to need to define a function for inserting and a function for updating. And again, we're not going to need to define a function for deleting because um, deleting is, uh, because it's being handled by the, the, far, the cascading foreign key. So, so, in our insert, so in our insert function, basically we say, OK, well, for, you know, start from our current date, or actually starting from the beginning of the week for our current date, up until how many weeks into the future, which we're going to be getting from uh, the parameter we're passing in. So actually, let me back up a second. So this function is a helper function. I have not, this is not actually the trigger function itself, because you can see I'm returning void, not the trigger type. Um, the reason I'm doing this as a helper function is me as the application architect deciding to do it this way. Because there's sometimes I might just want to be able to call this function and you know generate arbitrary you know arbitrary uh, availability. So again, sorry, getting back to down here. So we have generate series, generate you know up until you know how many days into the future. Um, let me see. All right. So you know, and uh, so the parameter that we're passing in is an actual uh, row from availability rule. 
so um, you say, OK. Oh, sorry. So there's two parameters. There's the availability rule and the day of the week. And the day of the week is defined, you know, it's the ISO day of the week. So from here we say, you know, for, you know, starting, you know, from the beginning of all these weeks, you know, take our room ID, uh, take, you know, the, you know, the ID of the availability rule. So the available date is basically, we're basically able to calculate the offset of it by saying, all right, well, what's today's date? Um, oh, I think I might have a bug in here. Okay, so basically this is supposed to be, you know, we're able to calculate the offset of the date. Actually, no, there's no bug in here. So basically we say, you know, take the beginning of, this is, yeah, this is the beginning of the week. You know, take, um, you know, add, you know, the ISO day of the week and subtract one because uh, if we're at the beginning of the week, we shouldn't be, and we need that first day of the beginning of the week. We don't, um, you know, we, we, you know, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to increment it by, you know, one too many. So this is preventing an off by one error. Um, we then create the range here. Um, and basically, the, this is, this is, here's that one real world check you know, I talked about in terms of time wraparound. I basically say, well, if we see the end time is greater than the start time, then we need to be able to increment our you know, timestamp range by uh, one day. Um, otherwise, we, uh, you know, otherwise, we do it you know, as normal to generate you know, that block. So I think the easiest way to you know, finish explaining this function is to see it execute. But first, we'll need uh, we'll need some availability rules around that. All right. So now we're going to actually build out the trigger function for this. So the tr we're building out the trigger function for the for generating the availability into the future. So the way we do it is that uh, re recall that we have the array of days of the week on the availability rule function. So that's you know that could be anywhere from one through seven. So let's assume for now we're just doing Monday through Friday. So we could be we could have an array that says you know integers one two three four five. Basically, we loop through each day of the week and then we perform this availability rule bulk, bulk insert function that we see, which is going to be able to insert all basically all of our operating hours for you know for being closed for the next year. And you know, we need to be able to handle the update case too. What happens if I update, you know, an individual availability rule record? Well, that takes a little bit more work. The insert is nice because the insert says, okay, well, I changed the availability rule, you know, just, in, you know, sorry, I inserted an availability rule, just generate all the, you know, all the opening times, you know, over the course of, uh, you know, that period. Update, we got to do a little bit more work. And actually, I kind of... Um, there, there's a little bit, as you see in the comments, it gets a little bit tricky if you change the days of the week. Um, I decided to be very naive about it and say, well, if we've detected that we've changed the days of the week, let's just delete all the, all the availability that we generated because otherwise we got, you know, we got to essentially do like a merge type thing and that would make a lot more code. And, um, you know, just regenerate all the rules from scratch. So clearly, you know, from a you know from an architectural standpoint, this is, is a little bit uh, less performant, but uh, it's easier to understand. Otherwise, if we updated anything else, uh, we can actually use uh, some fairly basic math to uh, to generate the the ongoing availability or the the ongoing uh, openings. And pretty much, like the 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 two things that can change are your you know your start time and your end time. So essentially, it allows you to reset your ranges. And we have that guard if you know for you know whatever reason our rule is you know we want to be open from you know 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. So now the one thing about this code example is to create this function in the database. I actually need to go to. No, I don't. I need to go. Shit, where is it? I'm sorry, I screwed up. I need to go to here. And we, you know, we have basically the trigger that fires on inserts or updates because we don't need to do deletes. I noticed that. Cool. 
All right, so now we're able to generate, so now we can generate our default close times. Now we can generate all of our, you know, all of our opening times. But, you know, we need to start being able to generate the calendar because that's, you know, that's the key of all of this. So I actually created two helper functions that are able to generate all of the calendar information. Um, this is the first one of them. Obviously, it's very legible because there's a lot going on here. So we're going to break it down a little bit. Um, so for this experiment, just to help you know, keep things in context, we're going to have two availability rules. We're going to be open every day from uh, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And we're going to be also open every day from 9 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. And try to keep it simple. So what we're going to do, since we've already created some of our data, is we're going to essentially insert those rules. First, we create a room. And then we're going to create two, uh, two availability rooms for that room. And I'm also, in this example, I'm assuming that the ID of the room that's going to be generated will be 1. Actually, if we so, as you see, those two rules have been created. And actually, just to have a little bit of fun, we see all those ex uh, specific availability chunks have been created as well. Because I, I, I had it uh, sh show up in totally random order. So so far, everything's working. Uh, we can't we can't generate the calendar yet, but that's okay. All right. So, also, sorry, I'm just thinking of something. Okay. All right. So let's let's look into these two helper functions that will actually help us generate our calendar. And actually, that's the thing I'm thinking of. Let me. Uh, I'm going to clear out the table. One second. We'll come back and insert those rules later. Okay, so the helper function. So first, so I created two two helper functions. And again, this is more for a matter of convenience than um, you know anything specific. So the first helper function is basically going to generate what the calendar view would look like, just with my closed blocks and my available blocks. Then I'm going to use the output of that function to generate what the calendar view would look like if I have my booked blocks, and to combine them all together. Again, architectural decision. So, and so in this function, basically it takes two inputs, the, the room ID we want to generate this for and the range. And the range could be a block, any block of time. It could be for a given day, it could be for a given month, whatever it is. Um, and basically we're, we're going to return, we're going to use the, you know, the table returning function of the status, which is at, in this first function the status will either be closed or available, and the range for which that status is valid. The things we already, you know, we could return the room ID as well, but we know we already know the room ID because that's one of the inputs of the function. So, the first part of the function is a recursive common table expression, and this actually looks incredibly complicated, but it's not. We're gonna, well, it is, but we're gonna break it down. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna generate a bunch of dates, individual dates, um, from the range that we pass in. So let's pretend that the range we're going to pass in is just today, May 30th. So it would be May 30th the May 31st. All we'll do is we'll generate a single date here in the set returning function and say, okay, from May 31st, from May 30th, let's see if we have any availability rules, or sorry, any availability or any opening times that were set on May 30th, from you know, May, 30th, May 30th to May 31st um, in, you know, in DMS 1150. Great. So if we have any availability rules, what will happen is we, ha we do this, you know, we have this, you know, gigantic, you know, three-headed beast here. And basically it says, well, it says, we actually have some pictures that will explain this. But basically it says that, see if I have any overlaps. If, I'm, if I have any availability overlapping with my close times, we're going to need to be able to split up these ranges. Remember those pictures we saw before where we have, like, cut our ranges into various pieces? This is what's letting us do that. 
and that's what all of this code says. And I think you know the best way to, the best way to be able to look at this is to be able to explore it visually, um, which I have a few slides ahead for this because you know explaining you know going through this line by line right here is going to be like very overwhelming, and I think I'm going to lose people. So ultimately, what you know what what this uh, select uh, select list says is, all right. Recall in our example that you know we know that our you know our operating hours are from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., which means that we need to split our closed hours up from you know originally our initial our default closed values are from you know midnight to midnight. So we have you know two sets of operating hours: 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. to 12:30 p.m. And our original you know our original closed hours are this giant chunk. So we basically what that what all those selecting case statements do is that it splits up the two chunks. So we'll have one row that says, all right, well, I'm closed from midnight to 8 a.m. and I'm closed from 8 p.m. to midnight. And then I'm open from 8 a.m. to uh, tw uh, to 8 p.m. Then the second one says, okay, well, I'm closed from uh, midnight to 9 p.m. Then I'm open from 9 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. and then 10.30 p.m. to midnight. So those are our two rows. And that's what those gigantic case statements do. <coughs> now, now we have the recursive case, which we're, you know, we, we, we're actually able to use union on this because uh, there will be some uh, duplicate rows that are returned here. So the key thing I want to point out in the recursive case is the froms. So the first is we're, we're saying from on, I guess I uh, basically, our recursive table, which we call the availables, you know, we're selecting the data from that. Oh, sorry. Um, then we're joining our availability table to see if we have any overlaps with any openings. So, the first thing we check is, you know, one, you know, Demarche 1150, whatever room we're in. Um, you know, that that date range that we set up, which is our, you know, availability on today, May 30th, from midnight to midnight. One of the key part is we want to make sure that we're finding, you know, we're comparing. Our center range, so our center range, recall, is when we're open. And we want to see if there's any other overlaps between that and our recursive set, because if there are, we, need to, we might need to further chunk our data. Ultimately, our goal, if you come back to this slide, our goal is, is we want to be able to take, we want to be able to see in like, not a single range, but in our view, we want to be able to say, all right, here's my minimum, here's my minimum closed area, Here's my you know, minimum available area. Here's a closed area. Here's an available area. Here's a closed area. And we need to, you know, the way I like to think of it is that you we just need to like smush all these ranges together and get, you know, be able to get that result. So this, is, so this part of the query is helping, sorry. <laughs> this part of the query is helping us to get to our smush function, which we're not quite there yet. But what this part does so that's the part I wanted to highlight. I'm sorry I didn't go to that one. Um, what this does is this basically finds all the overlaps we've not seen yet based upon what we've recursed versus what's existing in our database. And for instance, you know, one of those overlaps is, you know, you know, we have that 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. availability chunk, but we have that new closed chunk that was created by the, the other opening chunk. So there's an overlap here. So we need to be able to split this up. And that's essentially what this part does. It says, like, okay, well, you know, the farm, you know, this part of the query has found this new overlap that we didn't realize existed before because we had no idea because we've just started iterating on it and you know trying to you know uh, divide up these chunks, and this part actually does the chunk division. So as you see from here, the difference between the difference between what we had um, over here. Is now that we've chunked it up and said, okay, from uh, midnight to 8 a.m., I'm closed. From 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., I'm open. And from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., I'm closed. In the context of this row, because we also, I mean, we do know our closing time is different overall, but we have to do it row wise in order to, to chunk it up. So looking at the full picture, um, I probably should have made it clear like, now we have you know, four rows that we're dealing with. We have those two original rows from the, the base case of the query that's, you know, that are standard overlaps. And now we've created two more chunks based upon uh, what we originally were chunking together and uh, you know, the recursive query that, you know, that we've been doing now.
So the last part of the query is we're done with the recursion. You know, eventually what's going to happen is assuming there's no infinite cycles with, actually there will not be any infinite cycles here. Oh, well, in fairness, in the first versions of my query, I did have infinite cycles. You are, you are seeing uh, the pain that I've gone through. But the last part is, I call it, this is the smush part of it, where basically we say, all right, we have all, the, we have all these things here. You know, we have, you know, in our, in our left sides and our right sides, we have the times where we are closed. In our center, we have the times that we're opened. And we want to find, essentially, what chunk, you know, so the final part of this, you know, this aggregate basically says, find me the chunks where they cannot be contained by any other chunks. So if I have a close, so basically if I have like, if I have a closed block, let's go back to here. If I have a closed block, find me a closed block that cannot, you know, that's basically contained by, that's contained by all other chunks. Because then I know that's my smallest unit of a range that I can, that I can build. Basically, the TLDR, what this part of the query does, is it basically says, okay, well, you know, you know, this can, you know, this, uh, this closed block here can contain other closed blocks, so I'm going to eliminate it. But this closed block here can't contain any other closed blocks. Well, I mean, these two are equivalent, but I can eliminate, I'm going to eliminate that with my aggregate. Same thing here, this available block, you know, you know, these two available blocks are equivalent, so I can eliminate those. Um, this closed block here can contain other closed blocks, so I'm going to eliminate it. This closed block is, you know, cannot contain any other closed blocks, and same with this one. Um, and you know, since there's a, you know, you know, we can keep those, and we can eliminate the ones that look just like it. That's more or less what this this part of the query does. It's also why I'm going to make the slides available. And sure enough, you know, with the aggregate, it all smushes together. And we have our, you know, our closed times and our opening times for the given week. Cool. How are we feeling? <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, I, yeah, like I said, I think you know, the TLD, I mean, really, the the TLDR for all of this is one. Of course, you know, you can do this all with an SQL function. But two, like, even though like that SQL looks very scary, and I can tell you the first time I wrote it, I was very scared of it. When you start breaking down pictorially, you find like it's actually not that intimidating. And of course, like once you've written it, it's written, and you know it should hopefully work forever. And that and that really was a lot of the purpose of it was just to show you know to, to demonstrate what this function is. So what about unavailability? Because we just did we did, we just did closed and open. We didn't do um, booked. So like I said, there was two helper functions. This is the second helper function. <laughs> Here's the good news. It's actually very, very similar to that function. So if you're able to understand that, you're actually in pretty good shape. So we're going to hand wave it. Also because I see, you know, we're coming, you know, we're, you know, we've been sitting for a while. Um, the good news is, um, what function is this? All right. So, so now, you know, we can basically take all this work and use this to manage the information on the calendar. Um, both the, so basically that helper function, the second helper function is called calendar generate calendar. It combines the output from that first one and takes all, all the times that are booked and does one more giant smush. And here's the, by the way, here's another really cool kicker too. Even though that looks like a lot of code and there's a lot of expressions and operations going on, it does execute relatively quickly. The operative word being relatively quickly, um, and we'll go see a few examples in a second. But, but that's the key. Like it's not going to take, you know, it's not going to take, you know, depending on, so we, we, you know, I had a fairly large data set size to deal with it, and it's still operating, you know, very efficiently. Like, it did not bottleneck the system in the new method that we'll see. But, yeah, it's actually, it's nice. I'll put it that way. Um, so this is, so this is going to be, uh, this is just, again, one, one last helper function to, um, you know, manage the information going into the calendar. Then we have our triggers that we're going to put on the availability table and the unavailability table, which will basically keep the calendar in sync whenever we change our availability and whenever we book something. And the reason we have that helper function is that both function, you know, both the calendar management functions are the same, you know, regardless if you're you know, dealing with availability or unavailability. We're basically saying if we change something on a given date for our, for our opening times and our book times, 
just regenerate the calendar for that given date because we'll be able to do that quickly. And of course, create the actual trigger definitions. Cool. And we're done. Actually, we're not done because we actually need to create all of it. And the easiest way to do this is. Anyway, nothing up my sleeve. That's the example. Cool. So we should probably actually test it to see if it really works, right? Oh, so actually, do we? So we have about 30 minutes left, and I have, let's see how many more slides. Actually, I have about 30 slides left. So do we want to test it now and then take like a quick stretch, or do we want to keep going for it? Keep going? Let's do it. Yeah, I love it. Okay. No, oh, ah. All right. So, I've done this live demo a few times now. I am not scared. That's what I tell myself before I do a live demo. <laughs> so, all right. Yes. Yeah, well. So we turned on timing. And again, you know, hand wave, we're going to hand wave timing a little bit. You know, this is just give us general guidelines. So first, we're going to create a room. So we run this function. You know, we're going to insert, uh, we're going to call the room DMS 1150. And it inserts. You probably noticed that that's actually technically invalid SQL syntax, and that's correct. It's because I echoed that. I basically echoed the SQL, and I probably should have echoed it properly. All right, so let's look at our calendar for today. So, so we're going to run the function. Select star from calendar, where calendar date equals today. Order by lower calendar range. Lower calendar range is this part. And basically, we're ordering by the timestamp. Because at this now we're in a real application. We've got to start using the order by function again. So basically, we see that our default data is there. We've insert um, you know, the cal you know, calendar information for today, and we're just closed. That is that big, white, closed chunk. And also, you know, things look like they execute very quickly. Like that insert took about, you know, 10 milliseconds. Even though it inserted an additional 365 rows, it was still pretty quick. Which also makes sense, too, because it's like it's an empty database. It should be fast. All right. So this room, Dimarche 1150, only allows bookings from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. on Monday through Friday. Are we good with that? So we're open from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m and 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. And in between, we have a three-hour siesta. So the function we use to generate, uh, generate this information is you know, the insert. Um, you know, we, select, we get the room ID from DMS 1150. We say, you know, I, again, I want to show off lateral. So I created a, I created a, you know, a table you know, containing you know, these two tuples, um, expanded them out. And you know we have you know Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and our days of the week, and you know getting our pri you know primary key ID from uh, DMS eleven fifty. So this took about a second to insert. Let's keep the, let's keep that in mind because like you know if we you know if we do the math. Um, so if we look at our calendar now, so like a few things happened. Um, if we look at our calendar now. We now see that's chunked everything up. We have you know, a closed block, an open block, a closed block, an open block, a closed block, which is what we expect, right? That was a, you know, we basically ran the smush function and, was able, and were able to divide everything up. But notice you know, the way we ran it is you know, we ran it using triggers. And the triggers, everything has to, you know, basically everything has to commit in order for the statement to be successful. And when we did this, you know, when we inserted the availability rule too, keep in mind, we had five days of the week uh, times 52 weeks times two sets of times. So, so 10 times 52, we inserted 520 rows. And keep in mind, as you saw from those other triggers, every single time we insert an you know, a, a data into the availability table, we execute a trigger to refresh the calendar on that given day. So then we had an additional you know, 520 calls around that. So keep in mind, roughly, 
Um, we saw that when we inserted the, you know, the closed box for 52 rooms, that was, sorry, for the one room, the 52, sorry, the 365 closed box, that was roughly 11 milliseconds. If we extrapolate a little bit, we can see that, that uh, even though that calendar, you know, that calendar manage function is relatively quick, if we're doing it, you know, 520 times, it is going to start adding up over time. So let's keep this in mind when we're thinking about how we manage, you know, how we continue to manage the calendar. So let's see what happens if we extend our, you know, so remember we have that closed block, uh, sorry, that open block from, you know, 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. Let's extend it to 11 p.m. and see what happens. All right, so, you know, we've gone from, you know, I was being a little bit lazy with some of the times, but um, we've gone, you know, from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. And if we look, so notice it took about 600 milliseconds because we executed, you know, in addition to all the other triggers, we executed the calendar manage function every single time. And, but we did, you know, we do notice on our given date, you know, the time did update correct. You know, it is showing, sorry, correctly, it's showing uh, 11 p.m. And, you know, the closed block has changed from being from 10 p.m. to midnight to 11 p.m. to midnight. So our triggers are working. This is more just to show, like, hey, it's working. And also it takes a little bit of time. If we remove all the rules, well, this is, this is the, the delete cascade foreign key that's going on. We remove all the rules. We're back to our calendar just saying that we're closed all day. And if we delete the room, we're back to our calendar just having no information in it. So we're keeping everything in sync. Like, this is cool. Like, we built, like, we did build this real-time application. So I'm going to restore us back to our original data. Let's say we book an event from uh, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. So here I was able to remember how long the tutorial, tutorial is actually supposed to be. So I got the correct time in there. And, you know, yeah, scrolling up. So we insert, you know, we insert the booking. And actually, this is really fast, because even though we need to call that, you know, calendar refresh function, um, it's, you know, we're not cascading as much information together around it. And if we see, if we look at our calendar for today, closed, available, unavailable from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., and, you know, available from 12 p.m. to, you know, 1 p.m., you know, it's still working. Like, it's in sync. We have, like, you know, we have this whole calendar. It's spit out. And, you know... And look how fast the lookup was. Like, this is a sub-millisecond. This is cool. It works. All right. So let's say we book a second event. So let's say we booked a second event from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Yeah. Here we go. 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Still Still fast, and like here, here's the cool. So, so remember when we're doing this lookup, um, we're actually taking advantage of the multi-column index. We're, that was the room ID, and then you know followed by the date. And what's nice is that you know particularly if you're dealing with a much higher volume system, you can quickly generate your you know your full availability calendar for a given month. Like, and that's really powerful. Um, Needs to start one hour. So let's say the second event needs to start one hour earlier. Lo and behold, you know, now it's starting at 5 p.m. Everything updates correctly. Cool. How long did the update take? Eh, seven milliseconds. You know, not, not bad. <coughs> let's say the first event cancels. We perform a delete. You know, that's pretty fast. Everything updates. Cool. So the application is working. Exactly, you know, famous last words, right? What did we learn? You know, again, from a little bit of hand-wavy test. So first, always test your live demos. Um, the availability rule inserts took some time. And we see it's because, you know, we, you know, if you, for a given, you know, day, time, block, you know, we're going to be doing 52 inserts. And which also means we then do 52 calendar refreshes from a non-trivial function. So, you know, this is going to start adding up really quickly. The updates on individual availability, you know, av individual availability chunks, like just the one-off, one-day availability rule, those are pretty fast, as are the, uh, you know, inserting a booking. Those are pretty fast, too. But again, keep in mind, they still call that non-trivial calendar refresh function. 
But if you're doing it just once, you know, it probably won't hurt too bad until your data set starts growing. The nice thing is no matter what, the lookups are fast, you know, thank, you know, thanks to you know, our indexing scheme. And then ultimately, the people who are you know, the end users of our system that we're managing are going to be very happy from that. But you can see what I'm getting at is that for us who are you know, managing you know, Demarche itself, this might start slowing down very, very quickly. So let's, go, let's try to go to web scale. So, oh, ah, I suppose, let's see if we have enough time to do web scale. So I, I always like to do web scale as a tongue in cheek thing, you know, for, for MongoDB. So the first thing, so let me show you what's going on. Can we? So, uh, so some, of, some of this is going to give the answers while we're running. And part of the point is, so first thing is we generate 100 rooms within Demarche, which could actually conceivably have 100 rooms. This building's gigantic. And I'm from New York, I'm saying this building's gigantic. It's, okay, it's not gigantic. So first, the first thing that happens is, uh, you know, we select count from, you know, calendar. And we see, you know, from, from our default, you know, if we insert our default closed rules, there's 36,500. So let's generate a set of availability rules for, you know, every single room. And even though there's only, you know, we basically said, okay, there's 100 rooms. Um, we're just going to do from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. We only insert 100 of these rules, but... You know, when I did this run, it took about 60 seconds. Because even though, because keep in mind, you know, as you see, we've ballooned from, you know, 36,500 uh, entries in the calendar to 90,000. Because keep in mind, every time we insert an availability rule, this could be 52 times days of the week, uh, you know, availability blocks are going to generate, which means we have to do that number of calendar refreshes. And keep in mind, because, you know, triggers are atomic, you know, everything has to execute before we can commit the transaction. Like, we can't, you know, necessarily distribute this load. Now, everything will be correct, well, assuming that we coded correctly, which we did, but, you know, we're starting to hit this performance penalty. And if we generate a bunch of unavailability, you know, let's say we're bulk, you know, we're inserting, you know, in this case, 36,000 rows, the time on that is starting to creep up, too, because as we get more and more data, those refreshes get more and more costly to run. And... You know, at the end of the day, um, as I hear my computer starting to heat, you know, heat up, the lookups are still pretty fast. Um, let's see if we're done generating it. No. Yeah, we're still, you know, we're still, you know, my computer is still working on, you know, that initial availability rule generation function. <coughs> Here's the good news. The, looks, the lookups are still fast. But what's not fast is, uh, you know, managing the, you know, managing the calendar. And that sucks because, you know, those are the, you know, if you're designing that internally for your company, those are, those are your teammates who are, like, dealing with some painfully slow updates. And this comes from a real-world example. We, uh, you know, we basically, you know, at my old company, we had a calendar where you could look things up very quickly, but updating any of the availability rules, it was taking, like, you know, 40 seconds, 45 seconds just to make, like, a single update on, you know, a single rule. And the system became unusable. Like, we, you know, we essentially had to revoke, you know, from our customers who are interfacing with that system, we kind of had to, like, remove that feature, and we would only manage it internally. And that just sucks. That sucks for everyone. And, of course, you know, as an, en you, know, you know, engineering that, you know, as a point of pride, like, I, you know, I was miserable. <laughs> like, I, I don't like people having a bad time. And it's still right. It is all my fault. But, you know, you know, you know, you know what, it's like what, like the phoenix out the ashes, you know, we can do better. And that's what we're going to try to do. Okay, so like I'm giving up on this because it's it's just taking too long. <sighs> All right, let's do it in 20 minutes. Yeah. So, and the, and I mean, here's the long story short. Like, so even with only 100 more rooms and a few set of rules, like the rule generation time just like ballooned. It was unusable. Lookups are still fast. So we're going to do better. And this is where we're going to introduce logical decoding. How many people are familiar with logical decoding? Cool. How many people are familiar with logical replication? Cool. So logical decoding is essentially, is basically the basis of logical replication in Postgres. What it does is it replays every single change that's going on in your database. So every single write. So if you insert something, it streams a change. You update something, streams a change. Delete something, streams a change. So this is really cool. 
Um, and, th and like I said, you know, logical, so this has been available since Postgres 9.4. Logical replication itself was added in version 10. But we've had this, you know, we've had this feature for a while. And it was actually good because, you know, wh when I started implementing this at my old company, we were on Postgres 9.4. Um, there's a lot of, you know, there's a few things to note when using logical decoding. Um, first off, to use it, you need a logical decoder. The one that's built into Postgres is something called the test decoder. The test decoder uses a format that is unique to Postgres because it was used to test out the logical decoder worked. There are actually people who have written uh, tools that parse the test decoder and run it in production. I'm going to you know, reserve judgment on that. But fortunately, there's that, you know, recall, you know, several hours ago, we talked about wall to JSON. Basically, that's a, that's a decoder that uh, takes this changes streaming in and converts it to JSON and makes it usable by pretty much every programming language under the sun. And that's what we're going to use. Um, the way you set it up is you create something called a logical replication slot in your database. Basically, what a, so logical, so replication slots in general were, were added in Postgres 9.4 and basically say, all right, somebody wants to connect to my database and stream all the changes from it, be it, you know, physical replication that's been available in Postgres since 9.0 or, you know, ultimately logical replication. And it basically says, I'm going to keep track of where I am in the database with my changes. So I will always make sure that I've, you know, I'm storing all the write-ahead logs or all the changes, you know, up until that time. Once those changes have, once like whoever's connecting to my slot have acknowledged those changes, I'm going to start getting rid of them, you know, keep, you know, and basically, you know, make sure my disk doesn't get too big. The caveat in there is that if you never acknowledge those changes, Postgres will keep holding all of those logs and all of those changes until it runs out of disk, which is, uh, you know, a bad time. But each, uh, you know, basically, you know, the interfaces to logical decoder allow you to say, okay, I've acknowledged these changes, and you know, basically, you keep streaming those in. Um, yeah, so only one receiver can, can connect to a slot at a given time. And this basically allows you, this allows you to maintain the atomicity of the changes for a logical slot. If you do need to have multiple people listening to changes, you need to create multiple slots. But this is not a way to parallelize the changes that are streaming in. There's other ways to do that, which we'll touch on very briefly at the end. But it also makes sense, too. You need to, you know, you need to know the order in which the changes are occurring so you don't, you know, misapply them, you know, with whatever you're using. Um, uh, one important thing that bit me very early on when I basically thought, like, this feature didn't work and was stupid is that you need, your tables must have primary keys for the logical decoder to work. If you do not have a primary key, the logical decoder does not work, and then you have a bad day because you're like, why are these changes not streaming in? I don't get it. So... Um, I don't know if that's going to be changed at some point. This is actually at the conference to talk to people about that to see if that's even possible. I love PGCon for that reason. All right. We talked about the test decoder. Um, we're going to move on. So there are a few different logical decoding plugins out there or things that use logical decoding. Um, Walter JSON is written in C. JSON CDC is written into Rust. Last time I checked, it did not work with Postgres 10. Maybe that has changed. The Beezium is actually a project. I, can't, I call it like the RRM for logical decoding because it actually works with multiple databases, not just Postgres. Um, it's an interesting project to watch. I last looked at it in, I think, January. Uh, something to keep an eye on. Like I've been hearing it more and more in industry of people evaluating it um, you know, for, for various things. So... Which drivers support it? Uh, well, libpq, which is in C, as well as uh, the PG risk logical uh, uh, binary that comes with Postgres. Um, Postgres functions can interface with it. Um, there, there, well, there's various Postgres functions that allow you to, re to play changes off of the logs and acknowledge them. I think that, you know, that's also part of being you know, you know, available in libpq. Python, as I mentioned, psychopg2, which is what we're going to use. Um, and GDPC has supported it since version 42. There might be more now that uh, support it. I actually do need to uh, uh, look for that. But of course, if you hear of anything, please let me know. So how do we use it? We got to do a little bit of configuration. I've gone ahead and done this configuration in my database. But the key things that you need to know are in your postgresql.com, which is your main configuration area, you need wall level set to logical. 
So WALS just real quick stands for write ahead log, and that's basically how we track all this, all the changes that are coming through in uh, in the database. I have mock, max wall senders set to two and max replication slots set to two. So max wall senders, those are those are basically the tasks that let you, you know, send the, the wall changes over the over the stream. And replication slots are what we we're mentioning before, the things that let you con connect to it. I chose two. You know, you basically choose as many as you need. <coughs> Basically, it needs to be non-zero. In your uh, pghpa.com file, you need to have a user that has replication permission. People who have replication permission do have a lot of permissions in your database, so please be aware of that. It's like, a rough way of putting it is it's kind of like super user light, um, so be very, you know, be very wary with that. Um, the one thing that's, the, where I'm screening this is development mode is I'm using the trust authentication level. Um, if you give anyone trust in your system, they basically have full access to your system. And for the purposes of development, I mean, if you if you have access to my laptop, then there's probably a lot more serious issues going on. <laughs> so I'm okay with having trust there. <clears throat> in the database, you also need to be able to create the re logical replication slot. There's a function called PG, create logical replication slot. Um, it takes two parameters. One is the name of the replication slot. Uh, the second is the name of the decoder you want to use. In this case, it is, you know, I'm calling it, you know, I'm giving a name of schedule and I'm using the wall to JSON decoder. Oh, and I guess I should be creating this now. So actually, one thing real quick. Sorry, I'm, I'm just going to, this, there's one thing I just need to prep one second. I just want to check one thing. Sorry. This is a little bit of the punchline, but I want to prep it since we're here. So, so as you see, we created the logical replication slot. The function returns two, uh, two items. One is the name of the slot. The other is, so the LSN is basically where you are in terms of uh, tracking all of the changes. So that's essentially when you're running a decoder, you're going to be sending up like your LSN to say, all right, I've, you know, I've acknowledged this change. You know, keep incrementing it and you know, tell the write-ahead log that it's free to like, get rid of those changes if nobody else needs them. All right, so first let's test to make sure it works. So I have a little Python function that I wrote. Um, well, function. I have a little Python class that I wrote that basically says, hey, you know, every time I get a change, you know, decode the JSON and print it. That's a long story short. Um, you know, again, I'll, I'll, make these, I'll make these examples available. Basically, we'll keep consuming changes, you know, from the stream until we, d we do control C. Then we'll stop and we'll close and we'll be good. Crap. All right, so now I gotta find that other window. There we go. Okay. So I have this code living in a file called um, Okay, just do this. If it's living in this file. So first, that's just a warning about uh, Psycho PG2 and some stuff happening. All right, so let's start, sorry. Let's start making some changes. So first, let's create a table. So notice, you know, we you know we insert the table and hey, look, we got something. Doesn't have much, but apparently there's been a change. Ah, crap! I lost the window. There we go. So let's insert 
jx so so look hey look there's the change it's there it streamed it it's pretty cool streams it again So let's say we stop it and we insert a few more things. What happens? Hey, it kept it and replayed it. Now notice it actually replayed another change, like one change too many. That is a bug I can't remember. It's in Walter J. Sonner's Psycho PG2. But OK, I just because just that, that came up, I wanted to point it out. Like it didn't. Basically, we did not acknowledge that last change we did, so we replayed it again. So basically, TLDR, make sure your changes get acknowledged. Um, but here, I mean, here's the, here's the long story short, is we are replaying you know, all these changes from the database. And we're doing it through this external, this external tool. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's atomic. You know, we're basically seeing all the changes in order. This is important. So. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to remember where we did. All right, so okay, so in this example, um, basically this was this was the I guess my original example to show this change is streaming across the wire, and if I didn't delete the entire database, we would see that as we inserted all of this, not only would we see these changes being inserted, but we'd actually see all the triggers being played out as well, and all of those changes in the triggers also being inserted in the database. Because essentially what the logical decoder does is it replays all the changes. So even if you're executing the triggers, like it's going to show the changes that are coming through the triggers as well. Of course, if you have triggers that insert additional rows within a transaction, it's all, that's all going to come over as one chunk over the wire. So we're not necessarily getting any benefit from using triggers with the logical decoder. We're going to have to think a little bit differently in order to get the benefit of using the logical decoder. Yeah. So here's the thing. We know that our most costly function in this is regenerating the calendar. So we know that it would probably would be nice to offload that a little bit. But we also need to make sure the changes you know, always propagate you know, and as close to real time as possible, because we want to make sure that when our users are viewing the calendar, they're getting the most up-to-date changes. Um, and we also want to make sure the managers who are managing the calendar are able to do the changes quickly too, so they're not sitting there for 40 seconds while everything is refreshing, because you know that that is horrible in so many different ways. So we're going to replace the triggers. We're basically going to use the same data model as before. You probably saw that because I, you know, I already pre-installed everything, and we use the same helper functions, but we're not going to use the triggers, which there is a little bit of lie in there. There are some delete triggers. Um, for one specific example, and that has to do with uh, deleting um, when we delete an um, delete an opening or when we delete a booking, and the reason is that we need some follow up information to successfully refresh the calendar, particularly the date, which is not available in the logical decoder. We only have the the former primary key. We don't have any of the information. So. We can't fully get off of the triggers in that case. There's certain places where you might be able to, but for how we're regenerating the data, we cannot do that. What we can do is that we, we can actually replace most, we can basically get rid of all the other triggers and move the workload over to, well, basically move things over to our logical decoding listener to manage, you know, facilitate the transaction of refreshing the calendar. So, um, as you, as you recall, you know, we still have, you know, we're basically going to be still using that calendar manage function as we see as before that calls, you know, those gigantic functions. Um, okay, we already looked at that. Oh, yeah, but, but yeah, the, the main modification that we make is, no, actually, it looks pretty much the same. Yeah. All right. So what's going to happen is that we're going to build a Python script. We're, we're going to have a pre-built Python script that we look at real quick. Um, and basically, we're going to see it read from a logical replication slot. And if it detects a relevant change, we're going to take an action. So basically, it's going to emulate what a trigger does. But we're going to be doing, you know, we'll be controlling this, you know, from how we're interpreting the data stream on the Python side. 
And the key is that this actually moves the work outside from that initial transaction, which sounds a little bit scary because you know, we do want atomicity when we're doing these giant updates. But it's OK because we know that we're getting these you know, atomic work units coming in, from, uh, you know, coming in from the logical decoder. So it'll be OK. We won't have everything committed all at once. But remember, if like, the logical decoder fails, that means we never acknowledge that we received that change, which means we can replay it and try it again until we get it to succeed. And that's really cool. Like we're still, like we're still like being able to process our data safely. Um, so this is, you know, this is nice. I think we might actually get everything we need to ensure everyone has a pretty good user experience. So how do we read in the changes? So what I did was I created a, you know, basically a hash table that you know, lists you know, all the different table names where the changes can come in. And based upon what operation occurs, uh, if it's an insert or an update, there's some SQL I run to follow up. So this is kind of like a trigger table where we have you know, essentially all the follow up actions that we want to take, excuse me, on everything. As you see, these are the similar functions to what we ran, or similar SQL statements as well, to what we ran before in our triggers. And then, um, and then you, know, the, you know, there's some logic here. You know, and again, I, you know, I'll hand away for it a little bit. But essentially, it's very similar to the, you know, that logical st uh, stream that we were uh, running before. Um, the difference is, is there's some more business logic in it. And there's yeah, business logic. Basically, it says we are able to connect to everything. OK, let's test it. No. All right, this is, like I said, the punchline is like 10 seconds long. So I have this running in something called Demo 5. And as I mentioned before, uh, this is going to be near real time. So what's fun is I do have a script that plays out all the different changes. Uh, it's actually this one. So what's funny is like I would run this script and you know, try to show you know basically try to show you know doing the selects on the calendar as they go along, but because this script runs a little bit faster than the logical decoder is processing and it's near real time changes, you know I, I it's better to run the commands manually to see what happens. So first thing first, let's insert our room. Remember, there's no triggers here; everything's being managed by this Python script. So I insert the room. As we see, if we, you know, if we look from here, we have our room. And if we look at our calendar, is it, uh, voila, it's inserted. No triggers. I can prove that there's no triggers because if we look at the room table, there's no triggers. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> what did I say about C programming before? <laughs> All right, so let's insert those availability rules. And remember, availability rules, let's make sure we have timing on. Remember, this was one, that function that took a while to insert. We run it. Four milliseconds. Yes, like fast. So we, this is probably going to scale pretty well. As you see from our debug output, like part of my French, a lot of shit goes into here. And if we look up the calendar, let's, let's see exactly how we uh, did the calendar. Are we going to get our availability rules? Yes. It's working. A question. Go for it. Um, I'm sorry, I missed it for a minute. But, um, so I also think that if you inserted a whole bunch of availability rules quickly, mm -hmm. Mm, nope. No. Because it's, it's yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, but the thing is, I'm at least doing it out of band. So like, the, and right now this is also being done serially. So one could say yes, this has the, the chance to back up. It does have the chance to back up, but you know, it's going to do a little bit of work. It's going to catch up, and there is a way to even offload it, you know, further and potentially avoid the backups as well, which we will touch very, very briefly because we are at 12, and I know lunch is important to people, but. You know, the key thing is this is working. The lookups are still fast. 
Um, skip ahead to inserting more. Actually, let's delete, let's delete everything first. Sorry. All right, so deletes are still slow. And remember that we do still have some triggers on deletes. But remember, in our real application, though, we're never going to delete anything because we're just going to have an inactive flag and set that to false, and then we can update it quickly. All right, so let's, uh, let's insert some more rules. So those, again, insert quickly. And they're updated fairly quickly. And we see that they're there. So let's insert some bookings. We see that it's there. So it's working. We're taking advantage of the logical decoder. We're, being, we're able to read the streaming changes, and everything appears to be well. And I think you know, this, you know, this is where we can start bringing it all home now. So the lessons from this exercise is that you know, logical decoding does allow the bulk inserts to occur significantly faster from a, you know, just doing it within, you know, with triggers and within a transaction. And you know that that was the goal, bless you. And in this application, we're able to get away with it because you know we you know for our users we you know we don't need full real time. We just need close enough to real time, and this gives us close enough to real time. And you know, and for a lot of applications, just close enough to real time is good enough. Like there's certain things where you probably do want real time. You know, we could list those out. You know, there's definitely like critical applications that need that. But for us, this is good enough. Um, the leaks are still a little bit tricky, which is why I say never delete anything. Just so to you know, archive. I know I'll keep saying that, but um, you know, if you if you just if you just need the primary key, it's fine. Like I said, in this case, we need the date to do that calendar regeneration, so that doesn't work. You know, and as this, you know, and as was being pointed out, you know, applying these changes, we're applying all these changes serially. So there's a potential bottleneck for long-running queries. And actually, this is you know, I, I talked about a query before where I took a union all and made it a union. But actually, I was actually in our production system running to that bottleneck. I think that was one thing I did to optimize it. The other thing, I had a stupid SQL error in it. And like combining, like basic combination of those two, like things sped up by like 100x. And like the, I mean, the bottleneck went away. Everything was going pretty quick. Um, there are some wonderful distributed streaming tools out there. And particularly, there's Kafka. Um, that can, you can use that to, as a way to perform your follow-up queries and further distribute the load. You know, you know the nice thing is then you know you you're able to at least acknowledge the changes on your Postgres stream and say like okay well I put this into my Kafka queue I'm acknowledge I put this into the Kafka queue and you know you probably want to you know store your transactional IDs and orders as you put that into Kafka so that way you ensure you don't go out of order you're basically basically I call this shifting the problem elsewhere because you have you do have potential bottlenecks that you can run into you know with that method but you know, at least you can, you know, one of the key problems that I don't want people to run into is running out of disk because your wall grows too big. I have actually nearly run into that myself when, um, I mean, yeah, actually I think it was, it was a similar application to this where it got into, you know, one of those infinite, like, restart cycles. I forget the exact reason why, but um, I was not the person who was managing it that day, and, like, the person who was was like, hey, uh, the disk is at, like, 90% full. Like, well, that shouldn't be because we have, you know, the other day it was like 10% full. So it was ba there's basically like an infinite loop that was causing things not to get acknowledged. So, like, again, one of those things with great power comes great responsibility. Always monitor. Conclusion. Uh, Postgres is robust. We covered a lot of features. And there's definitely, like, some eye glazing over parts because it's like, ah, how do we explain all this in three hours and get to everything? But... One, that's why I, I, I'm very happy to make the slides available and the examples available. Um, and again, we just scratched the surface on some of these features as well. I mean, PLPGSQL can be a tutorial in itself. Triggers can be a tutorial in themselves. Um, just data type. Like, I actually have a, a, a tutorial just on data types. Like, it's, you know, that, that, that's ever-expanding as well. Triggers, you know, a lot of, you know, you, you see a lot of hate for triggers, but like, look, there are certain things triggers are very good for. I think, you know, dealing with, um, you know, s some simple rewrites, like I said, you know, converting dates and times into t uh, timestamp ranges, actually I found very useful. Like as a before trigger, the overhead was very low. There is some overhead to using triggers, unless you're really writing them in C, in which case it's going to be like, you know, very minimal, but who wants to do that? But, 
you know, there are times to use it, but you also got to know when it's not good to use them too. And I think, you know, something like logical decoding is a tool that helps you to bypass triggers but still be able to get the atomicity you need, you know, in a relatively good speed. Um, you know, you know, the log you know, utilizing, you know, logical decoding and now logical replication does, can eliminate some of this overhead and basically you're transferring compute elsewhere. You're, you're taking, you know, you're taking that load and you're distributing it. You know, you're also freeing up your users to do other things or, you know, in ultimately your database sessions to be able to do other things and keep pushing things through your system. And of course, you no, know, this is a panacea. You know, you still need to use good architectural patterns. And you probably, you know, one thing that I said as going through, I was saying, you know, some of these were the architect's decision. You might decide that you want to chunk your calendar, you know, in terms of a week. That could be, you know, that could be a way of doing it. That might make more sense. Like I said, you know, it's up to you. And, you know, this is the, the art of programming. The science is learning all the tools that you have available. The art is, you know, putting it all together. And with that, go build some applications. There's a lot to think about. And I'd love to see, you know, other applications that, you know, make, make use of this concept as well. I think, you know, in case, you know, just by the way, you know, another term for this logical decoding is change data capture. That's, you know, probably the more, you know, familiar term. I should have thrown that in earlier. So I break for questions. Yes, Dave. Uh, a lot of pain. Like in the script? <laughs> a lot of pain. <laughs> so this is called uh, repeating your code. Um, <laughs> echoing, prompting, echoing, and having the same exact thing below. No, I, uh, I because I care. Um, yeah, I, I spend a lot of time on this. <laughs> I would be interested if you were still in science to just type up a, a blog post on Speak. I've been spending the past couple of weeks just digging into all the options of ESQL and the fact that people use to have some benefit of it and this would be one that I think a lot of people would find useful. Did you have a okay. copy right there? I haven't checked yeah. it. Okay, that's okay. I, I've been reading in a while too because it's been the month of many conferences because everyone schedules their conferences in April and May. And uh, you know, my, my role causes me to travel to a lot of them. So I will, uh, I will put that in the backlog. In the queue? In the queue. I'm actually, I would actually say I'm, I feel like I'm a terrible P, you know, PSQL user, but um, I don't know. Only because but you that, know all of the things you would like to be able to do with it. Yeah. Backslash D is like, is so powerful. Actually, but one of my favorite ones, which I don't know where they got this abbreviation from, but well, let me get to it. So, backslash df list all you know all your functions available in your default schema. Um, hey, let's do. Is it the, no, it's a trigger. This one. So, if you want to inspect a function easily, it's backslash sf, which has saved me so many times. But I. I don't know why it's backslash SF. I might actually ask people while hey, I'm here. Show. What? Show if I'm? <sighs> so, okay, I, I do have a comment about that. But, yeah, this, this, has saved, this has saved me so many times, being able to, oh, that's what it's doing here. Oh, I didn't apply the right version of the function here. Oh. But, yeah. Um, so, fun fact. By the way, in the upcoming Postgres 11, you know, normally to quit the terminal, as you see, you have to do something like backslash Q, which for people who are newer to Postgres, that is not that obvious. Postgres 11 introduces quit and exit to get out. <laughs> it is a big deal. So, and actually, in the in the beta in the beta one in the beta one press release, I made sure to add that. In fact, I argued with people to add that because I'm like, it should. It's like, look, this is obviously not like a prime thing to talk about, but like. From a usability standpoint, I actually think that's important because it shows that the community does, has listened to like the feedback of newer users, saying like, "This is really frustrating," and like the feedback of that's been like, "Oh wow, like, thank you for listening." I think, and I think that's really important, like, especially in an open source community. It's like there are a lot of smart people working on you know Postgres, let alone other open source projects. But you also need to hear how people are using them, and actually, some of these things that we talked about today are the result of listening to seeing how people are using applications. And I think you know it, it is very important to have you know the two-way communication around that. So sorry if that's like a whole side thing, but. It's like Minecraft, except that you move zero branch. 
<laughs> there you go. <laughs> nice. Cool. Any more questions? I don't want to keep people from lunch. Cool. Well, thank you for coming. So, so, so.